face directly at the face to the side would be the south side of the house on Burke Street. So for the Aegean, we were able to we relocate this balcony, move it to the front facade, and then it works very nicely, and you've got those drawings, and I can go through them again if needed. We weren't able to relocate this one. So on the Aegean, we were able to relocate three balconies. So it's one on each of the typical residential floors, one on the first floor, one on the second, one on the third floor. So the Aegean, that's the revision. We removed this balcony, relocated it to here. On the Baltic, which is on 3rd Avenue in Burke, at that intersection, so this is 3rd Avenue, this is Burke, and the house would be uh, directly right here where my cursor is, we were able to relocate both balconies that were facing south, therefore facing the side of that house. So this is the previous plan showing the two balconies, and this is the new plan showing the relocated balcony. So what we've done, we've taken this one, moved it here to the rear, we've taken this one, and moved it here to the front. No real effect on the architecture. It actually worked out nicely, and we think it's the benefit, of course, is as the board suggested, that we no longer, on, especially on this, um, on the Baltic side, which would be the north side of that house, there are no balconies facing it at all. That was a total of nine balconies. So there are three on the Aegean and six on the Baltic for a total of nine. So that's the, we'll call them four architectural revisions. That's number one of the revisions, which is the relocation of balconies. Um, so just just one, one moment. So how many do we have left that are actually facing the house? One on each floor. So you got three. Floor. So there are three in total. Three in total that are now facing the home. Yeah, and they are, and I should go back to it so I can help uh, better answer you. Um, so that one is yeah, right here right towards there. the back of that okay. house. So you have three that are left. Correct. Out of, we started out, we started with, out with 12. We with 12 three, when, yeah, we, when we're, down, we're down to three. Yes. Okay. We also were able to relocate the air conditioning condensing unit. There was some concern of their proximity to that house again. Mm -hmm. So this drawing on the left shows where we were at the previous meeting. Here they are in terms of location for the Aegean. So we relocated these units to the far side, further away from this house. And these units were able to tuck in a little closer here. So these were, these were moved this way, and these were moved this way. We think, again, addressing one of the concerns. For is there the, a side yard so that balcony that overlooks the house? Yes. Is that like, so the balcony ends? Uh, we, the there's end. a side yard separating. There is a side yard. Yeah, so where we, yeah. yeah how wide? How wide? Um, I don't recall. I can look it up for you after this. I think it's about six or eight feet. It might be a bit more. Okay. But it's it's substantial, substantially further than the edge of the balcony. The edge of the balcony only continues by 18, 18 inches. The majority of the balcony is set in the facade. Thank you. Sure. So for the Baltic, understanding the same concerns, these AC condensers are relocated here. So for, for reference, the house that I had mentioned a couple times is located here. These AC condensers, which were um, talked about and discussed at the previous meeting, were slid to here. Again, further away from the house with less impact, and we think still would be relatively efficient within our building. Another of the architectural changes, and this, this isn't necessarily change, it was more of a reaction to a, a comment. Um, one of the comments from the commissioner who's, who's not here tonight said, can we look at another color? So for specifically the, the Aegean, that's where the color question came in, where we had what was called a Navajo tan. It's, it's, it looks yellow here, but it's more of a tan. It's perhaps something bolder. So this is a, a bluish color that is something we can provide and is still a material we can source. We leave it to the board to decide if this is a, uh, a better solution relative to the previous. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I'm certainly open-minded and, and happy to listen. So that's the third of the architectural revisions. And the fourth is more of an addition. So previously on the design, we had, as our a direct numbering and signage, we had just the number 218, for example, on the Baltic. And 215 for the Eugene. Comment was perhaps we should look at that and add the name of the building too. It might be a little bit of a nicer entry point. So what we've done is, and you've got these drawings in front of you, we've added 
the name of each building on each of the signage for the address. So it was Tina Jean, which is the drawing I'm showing you here. And this is part of your package and Vault 216. And so can you tell me what the, ad, let's say, pick any unit. What's the, what is their address? Depending any on which building you're in, of okay. course. You pick a unit, any unit. Uh, What's their address? Anything in the Baltic is 216. All right, anything in the Baltic is 216 and then unit whatever. Correct. Is it two, it's a 216 Burke or 216? It's 3rd Avenue. All right, it's 216 3rd Avenue. Yes. Unit. Correct. Whatever. whatever two, three, Baltic. Four, however we decide whether it's 1A, 2A, 3A, or 123. Right. For, for mail delivery, that's going to be really tricky. Yeah, and I think the post tricky. office will dictate to us how they want it. Yes, yes. Okay. And that's it for the four architectural revisions. I tried to keep it short and sweet and easy for me, especially for everyone to understand where we were to where we are. Happy to answer questions. Anyone? I have one with the move of the balcony in the Aegean, that doesn't encroach into the right of way. Correct, it does not, not in any case. It's over, yeah, it's over top of the berm. Up to the yeah, top. so not even, yeah, and on that side, we've got quite a bit of distance for, yeah. for okay. front and yard, yeah. Just double check. No, understood. Um, I know that, I'd, I'd like to say that I very much appreciate the fact that you were able to move the, the terraces as we'd asked. Uh, I think that that's a great benefit to the homeowner and as well as the AC unit, so that was really, um, I'm very pleased that those were able to be moved. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any comments about the color modification that was requested, or would you like it to be left as, as is, or um, anyone? I think, you know, we, we aren't seeing very much color variation within the district broadly, mm -hmm. and I think the concern you know, that we've spoken about previously is that if everything is gray and tan and white it starts to all become oatmeal right and so I think adding a color is I think would be to a benefit especially in a speech community where our history is probably a little bit more whimsical than maybe a very talented restrained architect like yourself might prefer a more muted palette I understand but you know, I do think that repeatedly we're not seeing any color on any buildings. We're seeing gray and white and tan. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I do think that sort of it's, it's part of our history. And so that's one way to contextualize the contemporary architecture to our historic roots. Anyone feel strongly that it should remain any other way? I like the blue. I like the blue. I like the blue. Yeah, okay, well, there you go. Excellent. Then, as as a, if assuming we're approved tonight, if we were to be approved, as perhaps a condition, I can change the other views for the board as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. The renderings. Yes. Why do we? We won't ever see them. Again. Yeah, we won't ever see them. Yeah. Well, then it's perfect. Yeah. You don't need to update the renderings. That's great. Right. right. Is there a name for this particular type of wood? Yes. Like Alan. Booth Bay. Yeah. What's it? Booth Bay. Booth Bay. And it. And Carl and I. The applicant went through a lot of just for any variations. I wonder who gets the job of naming colors. I think it <laughs> must be just like some of the really a lot of creativity. Okay. Okay, that's the right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next witness I have is Mr. Curley, our engineer, and there are two items I will be addressing. Oh, oh just this. Oh, oh, yes, we have to open it up for, oh, sorry, for yes. public question. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. And to our uh, professionals, any questions of uh, the professionals? No? Our planning board has already asked questions. I'd like to open it up for the public. Does the public have any questions that they would like to pose to what was presented just now? And it has to stay to that discussion. Hello. Uh, my name is Teresa Peterson, Borden Avenue, Asbury Park. Uh, nice to see you all. I have a question. What was the reasoning behind um, moving the... Uh, condenser units. What was the request of the board, and then what? And then what was the overall? Um, what were we trying to do or accomplish by doing that? The condensing units at oh, I talk to okay. the microphone, but the condensing units were originally very close to the house that's in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were able to move them from there further back 
while still maintaining a, a good distance from the building to our east. So it's kind of now between the two buildings, the building two on Burke Street, which is our center, as well as the building to the east. So we thought it's a, we understood the comment and it's a nice compromise now. So it's separated as much as possible from both buildings. Okay, what um, was the decibel level of the uh, condenser units um, in question regarding that, or is this purely for aesthetics? No, not for aesthetics. It was a way of uh, <coughs> minimizing any impact we have. These condenser units are, are not very loud these days. So it was still, we thought, a very simple move, move location, further distance, less than impact. But you have to do whatever you can to minimize any noise anywhere. Right? Exactly right. Uh, so, uh, what is the impact if, in fact, the uh, condenser units are moved to the location in which you're suggesting um, as a result of the comments, uh, will there be a diminished uh, decibel, like, can you attest to the um, amount of decibels that are it's going to go down by in terms of that? No, or? that's not my field of expertise. I can just speak to locating them and the general understanding that moving further from a particular location, that two buildings, uh, residential buildings on either side of us, will benefit both. Okay, just wanted to know if the, if the decibels were gonna be within the city's purview, so to in order to manage. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah. great, thank you. Anyone else from the public? Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Warner Baumgartner, Fifth Avenue. Um, the, the image that's up there right now is pretty relevant to my question. Um, would the applicant consider um, strengthening the roof line of these buildings? The cornices seem rather weak, and uh, the eye just kind of glides off the building into the sky. Uh, typically, traditional architecture has, has a stronger cornice to stop the top of the building. Would that be something that the applicant uh, would uh, be willing to do? I'm going to object. That's beyond the scope of what we are presenting. It's an architectural question. But it's the honest yeah. testimony. We've are, actually we've already had this discussion during during prior meetings, and I don't believe that the board brought and brought that up as a request well, I'm for bringing modifications. It up. At this point, it's already the time. We just had passed. somebody ask about condensers, where there was Which, no testimony about condensers. Yes, there was. Yeah. Yeah. There was testimony okay. about condensers. I'm sorry. Okay. Please put a bigger cornice on there. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? Okay. All right, next witness. Thank you. I believe uh, that you were sworn at prior meetings and you understand that you're still under oath That's for this right. evening. Mr. Carley, you provided testimony with regard to the engineering aspects of this application on behalf of the applicant, am I correct? That's correct. And you made revisions to your plans based upon comments at the last hearing, am I correct? That's correct. And what I'd like to do is go through briefly the revisions that you have made to your plans. So there were two requests. One had to do with the orientation of, uh, and, and I'm going to be pointing at uh, this is sheet five of the site plan set that was resubmitted. And the date of the revisions on that is 6 2022. Okay. And we'll mark that as age 16. Okay. Got it. Concern uh, that was voiced by the board had to do with the orientation of the sidewalk. Uh, we had a jog that was placed in the sidewalk from the previous revision. Uh, we've straightened the sidewalk out in front of the building, and that's on the second and third avenues. Um, the second item uh, that was questioned and or uh, had, there was a concern over had to do with uh, in adding uh, some small retaining walls across the front of the property, which we've done. So we've added retaining walls on 2nd Avenue, on the um, eastern portion of Aegean, and then we've also added um, some retaining wall um, on the east side of the 
Very right, minor, minor additions, both retaining walls are, are similar in height, ranging about two, two feet to 18 inches. And that's the extent of the revisions that you made to the plan. That's correct. That's all the questions. Planning board, any questions? Well, Mr. Curley? No. Professionals? Retaining walls in the city right away? No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Curley. Uh, Brian Slough, Clark Agents. And uh, the question I had was the material of the retaining walls, how does that relate to the material of the building? They're going to match the exterior facade of uh, the lower portion of so uh, the coloring. Will the cap on the top be wide enough to sit on? Yes. Okay. So I think that answers what we were looking for to have some place where. People could sit if they wanted to, as well as you know, creating, creating an edge along that firmed up area that goes up to the parking area. So I believe that addresses our comment regarding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Just so I understand, the color is going to match the, the lighter color. Yes. Not the not the blue. No. The okay. lower portion. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Okay. Anything else? All right. Public? Anyone from the public would like to have any questions about the the sidewalk orientation or the retaining walls? Hi there, Shannon Brown. The very excited um, potential new owner of 1004 Berg. Um, my question has to do with the retaining wall, though, not on the sides of second and third, so I hope this is an appropriate time to ask. It looked like from the renderings there was a retaining wall that was going to be built along the property line on the south side of 1004 Berg between that home and the uh, Gian. Am I correct? I'm, in I'm sorry. I'm sorry to oh, say. I'm sorry later. to say that. That's okay. Rate, that the train left the station. Okay. Last time. So this would Got be it. the questions would be having to do with these Just retain those these two retaining, retaining walls. walls. Got it. Sorry to say. Okay, no, that's okay. okay. But you can have a comment later on. We will have a comment section. Yeah, perfect. You could say whatever you like. Wonderful. Okay. Anyone else from the public? Okay. Next. The last witness I have is Brian Leaf, our landscape architect, is addressing one issue before the board. Good evening. Um, uh, just left, you understand that you are still under oath and, uh, from the last hearings and that you remain under oath this evening. I did. Uh, during the last hearing, the main concern with the landscape plans that were submitted related to the rooftop lighting. And there was a request to drop the lighting from 12 feet to 10 feet and rerun the photometrics. Yes. That was done on the revised plans and submitted. Uh, the difference is very minimal, almost non-noticeable. But the revised plans reflect? The so revised plans reflect the 10-foot uh, mounting height. Right, we requested it to come down as far as it was yeah. made sense. Yeah, aside from that, the only other change to the plan was to shuffle the plant things around to accommodate the new retaining walls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions from the uh, board about the light? Anything? Uh, I have a note about add the uh, height to the planting schedule. Was that, that, was that done? Okay. That, was, that didn't change the plan at all. Yeah, just additional okay. information. I just want to get it on the record. Okay. Anything else from our professionals? Any questions from the public regarding the change in the height of the light? Okay. Thank you. And that concludes all of our testimony. Okay. Um, do, now that that con concludes all of the testimony, I'd like to hear from our board to see if there's anything that, uh, anything else that we want to uh, discuss before we come to, we're gonna open it up to the public for, quite, for uh, comment. Um, is there anything else that we, are we feel any of our questions have not been answered, or that we're all, okay. I'd just like our professors to comment on the, the changes. Any comments from our professionals about the changes that are, that have been uh, made, and that uh, that we've satisfied all of your questions and concerns? 
I will say that yes, the, our engineering memo has been addressed, and uh, you know, most of it has, will come during uh, resolution compliance if it were to be approved. Right. Um, I had a couple things I just wanted to <clears throat> that I made note of in our meeting notes. I just wanted to make sure it carried through. Wait, D Doug. You know what? Why don't we just put you both under oath just <laughs> before you make some comments? Um, so. Uh, our professionals, you, you swear from the testimony you're going to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I do. Thank you. So there was some discussion about uh, the use of the right-of-way during construction. Um, and it, the applicant seemed to agree that you know, none of the, uh, the construction wouldn't be on Bird Street in order to protect um, you know, access to the adjoining home. Yes. Um, so just wanted to make sure that was carried through uh, into the resolution if it were to be approved. Um, but everything else that was, uh, you know, asked to be changed at the last meeting uh, appears to have been uh, carried through onto the plans. Okay. Any other, any other, uh, anything else that, uh, anything from uh, CCH? So we, we, we good to go. So going through the review and discussing it with Mr. Sullivan before the meeting, mm -hmm. it appears that the items that the applicant testified to this evening address our concerns with the outstanding items that we had identified in our prior review in February. Okay, good. One last thing. Sorry. Sure, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> there was a, I believe you had requested, Barbara, that uh, the geotech report and, and file design for the, the stormwater system along the property be uh, Oh, yes. The I would not forget. Okay. But thank you, Very though. Sure. <laughs> no problem. Anything else? I just a couple comments myself. Sure, uh, go ahead. Just to go along with Doug's comment about Berg and the shutdown of the streets, obviously you'll have to get approval from uh, the city. Um, the applicant agreed to do a ge geotechnical survey uh, to ensure that the neighboring property at 4004 Bird is protected and will not suffer any damage during construction. Um, driveway was not to, not to be more than 18 feet. Uh, subdivision to be filed by map. Uh, utility meters located on the eastern wall to be landscaped for screening. Trash pickup to be private, mm -hmm. and with the rooftop amenities, uh, access will be controlled by gates with electronic monitoring. There will be a turnoff feature for the lighting based upon the published hours. It will be open on weekdays from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and weekends holiday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And there shall be no speakers on the roof deck to be installed. No right, and, we, and we'd also uh, mentioned about frosting the, uh, the garage doors so that they wouldn't be clear glass. Correct. So that we could, couldn't see through that. And part of that geotechnical analysis, we also had mentioned that there is, there's, would be an inspection offered by, and a, um, I'm not sure exactly what the, the what uh, I think it was Carl uh, Erver? Erler. Erler, I had mentioned, just to make sure that we have what he had said that we would do as part of that inspection that he offered for the inspection to be done and um, the te geotechnical analysis would be done to make sure that the home is taken care of. Correct. Okay. Anything oh, else? I'm sorry, there's one more comment. Go ahead. I have to put in here. Um, I believe the there's going to be an easement for the drainage. Is that accurate? That's, so that so that there's correct. going to be an easement that's going to affect both, both uh, condominiums. That is correct. So uh, that'll have to be reviewed by the board engineer as well as yes. uh, board attorney. Yep. All right. Um, okay, now uh, can I get a motion to open uh, for public comment? So moved. Second. I'll take Mr. Chameo and Mr. Angelico. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Open for public comment. Please um, stand up and uh, make your way to the microphone. If you'd like to make a comment, you will each have a total of four minutes to 
make a comment, please keep it relevant to the testimony and the application. Um, please state your name, spell your last name, and state your address, and Mr. Beekman will swear you in, and then I will start the clock. And just for just a, just to clarify a little bit more, it's not only the testimony that you heard today, it's a testimony that you heard over the last however many times we've been here, three or four times. So if you have anything to say about this application, this is your time. And then we, the board will listen to those comments and then we will um, make some decisions based on, on that. Anyone? Good evening, Shannon Brown. Like the color, B-R-O-W-N. My current address is 1018 Roanoke Drive in Toms River, New Jersey. Uh, but as I stated before, very soon will be 1004 Berg Street. Um, so Will you speak into the mic, please? I'm sorry, say Will that you again? speak into the mic? Oh, yes. I'm having trouble hearing it. I'm sorry. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Brown, before you start to speak, uh, yes. I just have to swear in each witness. Oh, or, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So you sound to swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. Sure. So um, I know I'm a little bit late to the game, but I have read all of the um, public documents, all of the public meetings. So, um, you know, some of the concerns that I have, of course, I'm very excited to live in this location. It's really, you know, been a dream of ours for some time. But that being said, um, as I was mentioning before, the concrete barrier is something that, um, or the, uh, retaining wall right along the property line as I saw it in the renderings. I don't know if that's accurate or not, um, but my interpretation of that um, potential retaining wall could present some issues with stormwater runoff for the property, um, our driveway property. Um, also, again, I know this is late to the game, but Berg is a very narrow street. You have two sides, you know, parking on each side of the street. Um, you're losing, I think it looked like six spots, um, six off street or on street parking spots, four on second, two on Berg. Um, I've, you know, not that this matters to anybody, but I do have two teenage children. We have four cars. We have two spots in our driveway. Um, so knowing that there's going to be a, an entryway to the Baltic on Berg and we're losing those two spots on Berg, um, with the congestion that it's going to bring down that street is obviously a concern for me as as the homeowner. Um, and then um, also the um, just the I just my big concern is with the groundwater, knowing that so much of the um, surrounding area is now going to be impervious land and obviously this is not my area of expertise at all um, but based on some of the things that I was reading one of the suggestions was that um, you know that underground parking should be no no deeper than five to six feet below grade when I look at the renderings again not an expert but it looked to me like maybe they were eight eight feet eight inches below grade um, so if that's the case then I do have some concerns for potential water entering the basement of, of our residents. Um, you know, I know there's already a sump pump there. So, you know, I know there are some times where there is some water in, in the basement at this point. I just don't want to see that increase, um, you know, based on the fact that there's some additional buildings being, being put up nearby. I think that covers my questions and concerns. Thank you. And, and, your, and your address is once again? 1018 Rodeo Drive. In River. And you're saying that you're moving into? We have a fully executed contract on 1004 Berg Street and anticipate moving in between August 8th and August 15th. And that's across the street from here, or that is that home? <laughs> that is that, that, is that home. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Jill Mondrone, soon to be the former owner of the house in the middle of this. Um, and I just have one follow-up question. I Listen, I had pages and pages of things that I actually wanted to say. It's sort of irrelevant now. Um, sorry, Mr. Mondrone. Yep. This comment period? Comment period, yeah, yes. So Mr. Beekman is going to swear you in if you'll raise your right hand, please. Certainly. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. 
Sure. Um, just a follow-up question. I'm curious if there was a traffic uh, study that was conducted, because I didn't find that in any of the documentation. You're, you're not going to get any answers. This is a comment okay. period only. Okay. So with, uh, curious about that simply because, and you just spoke about the the right of way. The right of way is 20 by 150 feet, right? It's the length of the buildings. 20 feet. The renderings show that that's halfway through the street. That's in fact, in the entire street is 20 feet wide. So I just want to make sure that the street doesn't get shut down and the homeowners, there's four driveways on that street that the homeowners can in fact get to their house at, at will. Mm -hmm. I believe that that was something that was discussed that Berg would not get closed. Yep, just wanted to we make sure. We have active driveways there. Great, thank you all. Even during construction? During construction, yes. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, Warner Baumgartner, Fifth Avenue, uh, city historian. Um, by way of background, I would just like, oh, oh yes, swearing in, Mr. Beekman's writing. <laughs> you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thanks. Um, by way of background, I would just like to say first off that I was a party to the creation of the architectural standards in the redevelopment plan. And uh, I think that this project is a good project going forward in terms of development, but it does not meet the goals and aspirations of the redevelopment plan architectural standards um, in two major areas. There are two fundamental flaws um, that are exhibited here. Um, the first being that both buildings look almost identical. Um, the plan aspired to have buildings differentiated from each other in unit block uh, sizes, you know? Like each building uh, lot is 50 by 150 and multiples of 50, say 100 by 150, 200 by 150. There was a desire to make even block size developments seem like smaller units by changing the architecture in uniform increments. Having two buildings like this um, covering essentially an entire block uh, makes it look like a project, and that was not the goal of the plan. Uh, probably something that can't be corrected at this point. We're too far into it, but for the board's future knowledge, um, that was one of the aspirations, to have um, smaller visual units displayed, even though there are large developments. So if these two buildings were differentiated architecturally, that would be a huge improvement. The other I brought up earlier, and that is the, the cornice, the complete or the almost complete absence of a visual stopping point at the top of the building, a cornice line. That's one of the fundamental architectural elements of traditional architecture. And the plan does basically uh, espouse using traditional architecture and architectural elements. That is, you have a base of a building, the middle of a building, and the top of the building. The top of the building, uh, usually a uh, soffit and fascia or a cornice in order to stop your eye from visually just going up the building right up into the sky, something of architectural interest. That would have been a huge improvement um, to both of these uh, developments here. Even though they're somewhat modern in execution, having traditional elements uh, would certainly improve that. Um, all in all, development is needed. And um, this is probably a good project, but it certainly does not meet the, uh, the standards or aspirations of the, of the standards in the redevelopment plan. Thank you. Anyone else from the public that would like to make a comment? All right, a motion to close public comment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Public comment closed. Well, that, that concludes then the, both our presentation, certainly also the public presentation with regard to this application. In closing, the only thing that I would like to say is that this development is entirely consistent with the Waterfront Redevelopment Plan. The amendments to the Waterfront Redevelopment Plan anticipate uh, developments of this size. Uh, this project in total probably takes up about 25% of the entire block. Um, it creates two separate lots. Um, two buildings on those lots, exactly what was contemplated by the Waterfront Redevelopment Plan. 
in essence, this is what the waterfront redevelopment plan was looking for, to increase the residential development within that area. There's a significant amount of land. <coughs> this accomplishes exactly what the plan had anticipated. Based upon that, based upon the revisions that were made uh, by my client in response to the questions of the board and the comments of the board, I would ask that the board grant this application and approve the preliminary and final in the site plan uh, request that's made. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does the uh, anyone on the board have any comments that they would like to make before we uh, proceed? Um, you know, I'm not sure um, exactly where to start um, here, but you know, I think it's important to remind the public that there was a long process here, and uh, at some point the applicant approached the redevelopment authority first, and in that process of negotiating a conceptual plan regulations were set in place by the redevelopment authority, which in our town is the city council. And by the time these plans come to us, we are here to determine whether it complies with the regulations set by the redevelopment authority and whether it complies with the redevelopment plan. And so while I think there are parts of this application that are extremely upsetting in a way, um, I think Mr. Baumgartner, in one of his previous rounds of comments, spoke in particular about um, architectural history, but that it extends beyond just purely the building. The alignments of our streets, the widths of our streets, the setbacks and the view corridors are also part of the way that the city plan was intended to be expressed. And there are certainly, Mr. Minervini is certainly a capable architect, but you know, I think there are ways that when these plans are coming to us, we have to start to think beyond whether or not height is the only parameter which we consider. In this case, I feel aligning the buildings with the existing home on Berg would have been a better outcome. It would have meant that some of the building would have had to have been taller or bigger in other portions, but the outcome would have been better. This building does take up a significant portion of its own lot. Whether or not it takes up a significant portion of the, of the, of the total block is to some extent irrelevant, but the lot coverage is so high and climate change is real. We need to re figure out ways to reduce impervious coverage. Both of those things could have been improved by stepping the building away from the narrow street. One of the recent speakers just spoke about the narrowness of Berg Street. And I think as these come forward, we need to, when they get to us, we don't have a lot of control over changing that. That's the unfortunate part here, is that we can look at this and say, this isn't what we, what we want to see. And to Mr. Baumgartner, Baumgartner's point, it doesn't meet the spirit of the waterfront redevelopment plan. And I think it also, in ways, does not meet the spirit of our master plan, because we need to figure out how we get people to enjoy the public environment. And that is through improving the ways that people get around that do not rely on a car. And in this particular instance, the building will be 10, 15 feet closer to the pedestrian than the previous buildings were, or any previous building before in history on that street. And so what do we get out of it? Um, is a question that I keep asking myself. And we didn't get pedestrian bump outs that could potentially improve stormwater retention in the public right of way. We didn't get pedestrian bump outs that could make people feel safe as the traffic that people have routinely complained about are implemented. We didn't get on-site affordable housing. The, the applicant has absolutely fulfilled their requirement for what is required by the plan. But I'm not so sure that the people who 
move into this building. We should welcome all of our new residents. We need people to move here. We need people to fill our businesses and you know, fill the schools. But how many of these people are going to be living here full time? If you could take that 5% of units and build them on site, that would be what? Three units with people living year round. And I think we want to start to see those things. And we don't see those things in the applications. And I feel like we're hearing, seeing it again and again and again. So while I think we're in the position of having to, or not having to, of, of following the law here, that's our job. And what we are supposed to do is say this complies. And in large case, it does. And in large case, it's a well-designed building. And we've done the best we can to, I think, mitigate the impacts both to the neighboring property, who will be surrounded by it, and you know the the future neighbors of it but i think that as we move forward we have to figure out a better way of getting things that do a better job of meeting of contextualizing themselves to their environment and paying attention to what's actually written in our master plan and I, no, i'm just not sure that this does that unfortunately sorry if that Any, was long great anybody else have any other comments that they want to make no other comments? Uh, I was wondering if, uh, Mr. Beekman, if we could put something in to ensure that, I know that we had testimony that Berg would never get uh, closed down during construction. Is there something we could put in those resolutions to make sure? I have that in mind. That we have that, that that's that not going to get that closed down? represented by the applicant that Berg would not be shut down. Okay. And also that I think that, uh, James, that we have a uh, an item regarding the, the way that we stripe to make sure that we're using the 25 feet, 25 foot from the curb, from the uh, corner versus the 50 foot, the exemption on parking? They, they won't be doing any striping on the road that falls to uh, our responsibility, the city's responsibility. So the, what they had shown us was only for our information, not really what they were planning on doing. Okay, and, the, and this is when, when they're going to do this after, we don't know when, some future. No, they aren't doing it at all. Okay, they're not doing it at all. No. So at some point, probably the city will stripe it Yes. Sometime, but it's not part of this project. And it'll be the city's responsibility to strike it how they want it. It's, uh, it doesn't follow that plan. Okay. But the rest, the rest of the city really does follow the 25 foot versus the 50 foot. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know if we have anything else that we want to put into the uh, the resolution. Any conditions besides the ones that we've already had the discussion about? Color. Sorry. Color. The color. Yes. We want to put the uh, the Booth Bay Blue into there, uh, and everything that was discussed today. Is that just on the one building? Sorry. That's the blue is just on the one building. Correct. I think otherwise, uh, the other items that we had we had discussed are all in. Mr. Beekman had mentioned them before, um, so. Can I get a, a, a motion to uh, approve this application based on all of the conditions that have been mentioned um, on this application? Move to approve. I second. I have a motion by Welcome Clayton and a second by Barbara Kissett. Mayor John Moore? Yes. Councilwoman Owen Clayton? Yes. James Bonanno? Yes. Jim Henry? Yes, I just want to make a comment, though. I uh, I agree with what Mr. Uh, Gardner has said about the uh, the top of the building and uh, the architectural issues. But in spite of that, I'm voting yes. Uh, I, I think this is a uh, good project. I think part of our problem is that uh, when these applications go before the Technical Review Committee, this is where uh, where we kind of fall down, and uh, we we have a lot of uh, Eric's comments, Arthur's comments, and if they can only be incorporated at that point, we'd be in better shape, I think. But yes, I am voting yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Eric Calico. Yes. Daniel Shanameo. I don't think I can vote. I don't think I could vote on it. I don't listen here for the initial. You 
the initial. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Um, and finally, Barbara Krizak. Yes. Thank you, everyone. That is a unanimous uh, vote. Thank you very much for your time consideration of this application. I do want to thank the board. put in a lot of time, a lot of thought, and your comments, and I truly really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Take five minutes. Mm -hmm. Take five minutes. I'll just move things around. Or maybe not. Hey, uh, Irina, yeah. should we take five minutes? Let's take five minutes while you, while everybody is uh, getting everything. A motion for a recess, five, five minute recess. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Five minute recess beginning. Aye. 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 All set? Yep. All, set. All set. All right. Let's get back to it, everyone. 8.01 <coughs> p.m. Mayor John Moore. Here. Councilwoman Yvonne Clay. Here. James Bonanno. Here. John Henry. Here. Uh, Eric Gallo. Here. Daniel Shanameo. Here. Rick, um, sorry. And finally, Barbara Krizak. Here. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good evening, Madam Good Chair evening. and ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Kevin Kennedy. This is a continuation of a hearing. Um, you'll recall we've been here on two occasions thus far. I believe it was uh, June 6th and also uh, April 18th. And we are here tonight and in the uh, very brief analysis, we are looking uh, for approval to demolish the existing structures on the site and construct a four-story mixed-use building which will contain uh, 92 uh, dwelling units, about 4,000 square feet of retail space, and about 7,700 square feet of office space. Uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, TJ Ricci is uh, seated to my right. He's our planner. We have not had him testify yet. Uh, with your consent and the board's consent, I'd like to have him sworn in. And then uh, after that, we have Jake Modesto, who is our engineer. Mm -hmm. He previously testified. I have some uh, short recall moments for him, for him to do some touch up on some engineering matters. And Anthony Vandermark, our architect, is here. Uh, one, he's here if necessary. Two, he's here to answer any questions. And three, when TJ leaves, he will be our computer consultant. So he's, he's uh, an important part of our team. So that having uh, been said, I would like to um, have the witness sworn. Yes, because we have to also, uh, have you presented before this board before? No. Like what your qualifications are? Can we go through that, please? Sure. <coughs> first. Yeah, we'll swarm first. Mm -hmm. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And your name for the record, and if you can spell it as well, please. T.J. Ricci, last name is spelled R-I-C-C-I. Okay, um, and Mr. Ricci, just for the record, you're testifying tonight in your capacity as a licensed professional planner? That is correct. Uh, why don't you, uh, tell, uh, pursuant to the chair's request, tell the board a little bit about the licenses and certifications you hold and the experiences, and if you've not testified this board, if you've testified before other boards? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, my name is TJ Ricci. I'm a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey. I'm also a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Um, I've been a planning um, consultant for approximately five years. I have a bachelor's degree as well as a master's degree in seated regional planning from Rutgers University. Um, I have testified before over 30 boards throughout the state of New Jersey um, in everything from single family to um, industrial, commercial, and to mixed use projects like the one we have here tonight. Mm -hmm. And TJ, for the record, are your licenses and certifications current and up to date? Yes, they are. Madam Chair, with your consent, I'd like to have um, him recognized. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, and so TJ, uh, uh, just to begin with, you're familiar with this site, correct? Yes. And you're familiar with the application? Yes. Sir. And you're familiar with the testimony and evidence which has been presented to this board thus far? Yes. Okay, so importantly, I'm just going to uh, turn it over to you. Could you uh, give the board some testimony regarding the planning uh, impact and effects of this and consistency with the uh, the redevelopment plan. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Chair, could you see this on the screen? Yeah, I was going to pull this up just for the benefit of the board. Um, how can we get 
this up there. I wasn't here last time when we set this. So I believe that this aerial exhibit was already previously marked. Um, this was an aerial exhibit prepared by my office, Stonefield Engineering Design, um, dated 4-13-2022. Madam Chair, I believe that was A1. That's correct. Um, so here we see the property in red, project site. Um, block 705, lots one, two, three, four. So the property actually consists of these four, um, you know, oddly shaped, um, pieces of, uh, of land that actually, um, you know, when taken together, uh, encompass, you know, roughly half of the block that we see here. Um, it's a corner lot. It's, you know, frontage on Memorial Drive and Springwood Avenue. Um, and then to the rear is the NJ Transit um, Railroad. So it's actually fronting on just two streets, but then bounded by the railroad tracks to your right um, or east. Um, so on the site right now is um, a former um, industrial, commercial uses. There's a couple buildings, a couple parking areas um, associated with those former uses. It's been vacant for um, quite a while. Most of the site is, is overgrown, um, in very poor condition. All the buildings on the site are, are you know, well in a state of disrepair. Um, and it's you know, pretty unsightly as it stands right now. It's a, it's a piece of land that's pretty desperate for um, redevelopment. Um, site is a little bit over an acre, approximately 1.14 acres, nice size piece of land. Um, when we look at the surrounding uses, it's you know predominantly um, multifamily residential. If we look to our left, um, uh, plan left or our west, this was a recent uh, multifamily residential development that was constructed, I believe, uh, approximately three or four years ago. Um, to our north, up here we have a commercial plaza and this actually this parking lot connects to the asbury train station um you know walking distance um, from the site and then also to our north we have another multi-family residential um, property this one has been around since i believe the 50s or 60s a little bit older um, and then to our south we actually see the asbury park neptune um, municipal border um, so as you guys have heard, um, the proposal tonight is for a four-story, 92-unit mixed-use building. Now, the different uses in this mixed-use are going to consist of residential, retail, as well as office space. Um, so this is a permitted use in the Springwood Avenue redevelopment area. That is the zone that we are located in, specifically the gateway zone. Um, specifically because you're driving um, in and it serves as a gateway area into the city um, of Asbury. Um, so in addition to the mixed use structure and, and the uses that are going in the building, um, there's a lot of other exciting features about this proposal that you have heard from um, Mr. Modesto and Mr. Vandermark. Um, those things include indoor amenity spaces, outdoor amenity spaces, that, that nice rooftop, um, you have street trees, you have um, all of these streetscape and sidewalk improvements to really kind of activate um, the street and, and, and totally um, help to revitalize this area. Um, so we are seeking um, some relief, um, but I think it's important to note that we are compliant with use, we're compliant with height, density, um, parking. Those are generally what we think of as the more um, strict um, regulations that guide land development. A lot of the relief that we do seek from the plan um, and from the zoning ordinance is more um, design related, specific to the architectural features of the building and specific to the, the odd shape of this lot. Um, so with that being said, for the benefit of the board, I'll just walk us through the variances. Um, so we are seeking a maximum front yard setback. Um, now normally it's a minimum front yard setback. You have to be set back a certain amount, but in this case, um, there's a maximum requirement of 15 feet because the intent is to bring the building close to the street. Um, so we are actually, we do extend beyond the 15 feet that would be allowed at 16.2. Um, and the reason is really 
um, due to the odd shape of the lot. It's just in this one part because, you know, the shape of this lot kind of juts out a little bit and then it comes back in. Um, this is more of a technicality than anything. If there is a, a, a right of way dedication, um, this will essentially be eliminated. Um, but the intent really of that maximum 15 foot front setback is to bring that building close to the streetscape, which as you can see here, um, we believe the intent is met because we have this um, fronting on this wide sidewalk, um, you know, close to the street line. Um, and then the second variance is a rear, a rear yard setback variance. Um, 20 feet is required. And on the plans, you can see we have 18.4 feet um, to the edge of the property. It's just in this um, one location right here. Um, you can see, you know, roughly the, the 20 foot line kind of traverses, you know, just outside of these parking spaces and that just this corner of the building kind of clips that and that's the part that encroaches into the rear yard. Um, it's actually 8.4 feet to the Neptune border as well. Um, but once again, the intent of this is met. We have a substantial amount of landscape buffering between the uses and really the result of that um, is, is, you know, the column spacing, the architectural features of the building and the layout of the site that caused that to kind of encroach into the rear yard, but very minimally, just for a very small portion just in this corner right here. Um, so that sums up the variances, but we are seeking design exceptions from the redevelopment plan. Um, the maximum compact stall dimensions, um, so nine, nine feet by 18 feet is required. Um, the, the plan has a provision, if you provide a certain amount of, of regular size spaces, you can um, construct compact spaces. Um, we don't meet, we're not eligible for the compact spaces because we don't have the full size spaces. But interestingly enough, Asbury Ordinance does actually allow for spaces and they allow for seven and a half foot wide compact spaces. So that's actually significantly um, lower than what we're actually proposing here. The result, um, you know, the, the reason really is, is dealing with the site constraints, is trying to balance providing um, all of the parking on the site and having the room to be able to do it, trying to work with the column spacing, um, trying to provide you know, a lot of these retail, a lot of these amenity spaces along the street line. Um, at the end of the day, you really don't have um, a whole lot of room to play, which is why we, we felt necessary to kind of um, um, reduce down those spaces. But the eight and a half foot wide compact space is generally a, a widely accepted industry standard um, width. Um, and then also, same thing with the drive aisles, 24 feet is required. Um, and I think at its smallest point is 21.1 feet. Um, if you look at the design of the site, most of the drive aisles actually do comply with the 24 foot requirement. It's just in spaces where um, there are um, columns that kind of interrupt um, you know, some of the drive aisles, um, that, that's the kind of the pinch point where why we need to seek that relief. But the majority of the drive aisles actually do comply with the 24 feet. Mr. Modesto actually testified to this um, and said that there were no, you know, there's no impacts to um, the turning movements within the within the garage um, and the loading space and the loading space clearance so we're required to have two spaces um, we comply with the length of the loading space but it's the width that we are not compliant with if we're we, we do have the one but they're supposed to be 10 feet wide and we have 19 feet so we're essentially one foot short of actually complying with that requirement and the reason being is it 10 feet wide or 20? I believe it's 10. But you have 19. We, yeah, so this is just one space, because it's one space. If we had one more foot, then we could put the two spaces. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so we do have a sufficient amount of um, loading area. Um, it's just, once again, it's kind of a, more of a technicality um, with regards to laying out the site, trying to balance and get everything onto the site. Um, and, and also, you know, provide the parking, provide adequate drive aisles, um, deal with the column spacing, et cetera. So you, um, do, so you do comply with one loading? Yes, but we do, we need a second one. We need two. So if we had one more foot, mm -hmm. we would be compliant with the number. We're compliant with the dimension of the one that we have, mm -hmm. and it's, it's almost big enough to have the two, but we're just a bit short. So you're asking for a variance for that? Correct. It's a design exception from the <laughs> Um, 
And then the loading space clearance, um, 14 feet is required vertical clearance and 13.83 feet is proposed. Um, Mr. Vandermark testified to this um, before. Um, it's really due to the site constraints and the, the elevation changes from Springwood down to Memorial Drive. Um, but it really is a, a de minimis exception and you know it's not anticipated to have any um, any vehicles that would be um, larger than 14 feet or you know that would go in there and, um, and cause any problems. Um, the minimum refuse storage area for residential and non-residential, um, we are deficient in the amount of square footage for the refuse area that we're providing. Um, we are providing 377 square feet. Um, as Mr. Modesto testified last time, this is gonna be a private hauler. Um, trash and recycling pickup each is gonna be um, two, if not three times a week. So it's really gonna be um, based on the traffic generate, I mean the trash generation and the demand, um, they're going to adjust and take that out as needed. So although we don't have um, the space, um, they're going to ensure that you know no trash builds up um, within that refuse and storage area. So how much space do you have? 377 square feet. You said that's what's required? That's what's proposed. I believe it was approximately 1,100 square feet is required. Wow. So it's roughly a third. Um, with regards to the architectural features um, and the architectural relief, um, we are seeking relief for um, non-residential facades should have a minimum of 60% of the ground floor as windows. Um, and we're at 29% for Memorial Drive and 26% for Springwood Avenue. Um, Mr. Vandermark testified that he will um, you know, work with the board professionals to add more windows and more glazing on that ground floor. Um, it kind of stems from a result of, of not everywhere, um, not every um, wall on this facade really requires a window because we have, you know, we have the trash room, we have mechanical rooms, we have, you know, a bicycle room. So, so it kind of stems from the fact that, you know, you don't want to put windows along the entire thing um, if it's not really necessary. But I believe um, he testified to last time we are going to uh, bump up that glazing and, and try to make it more, um, you know, more transparent. Um, and then the vertical alignment of windows. Um, so, and the architectural distinction bet between residential and non-residential floors. Um, so obviously the, there is no um, clear vertical alignment with, um, you know, the different floors. Uh, Mr. Vandermark testified that really this is the intent of the building. Um, the building was specifically designed this way to be more architecturally interesting. Um, with regards to the garage doors being visible from the street, um, they're technically not supposed to be visible from the street. Um, but really, when we have this corner lot here, um, we're fronting only on these two roadways. Um, Mr. Seckler, um, the traffic expert at last hearing, testified to the fact that you generally want to locate these driveways um, farthest you can from this signalized intersection. So really you're fronting two streets. Um, you have the two entrances to promote this internal circulation. This is kind of um, the best location for these driveways, um, but really to mitigate the concern of them being visible from the street, uh, Mr. Vandermark um, agreed that, you know, that we can provide some frosted or opaque, um, you know, glazing on them, make them, you know, not as transparent, not as visible um, and apparent from the street. Um, with regards to the street numbers, uh, street numbers are required at each door of the building. Um, we don't propose them at every single door on the front um, facade, um, only located at the residential main entrances. Um, we opted instead for the commercial and the retail tenants to just do signage. Um, I think people identify the stores and the you know, whatever's going to be there, the coffee shop by the name of the shop rather than by the number. So they are, but they are located at the residential entrances. But isn't the office, there's a second floor office, is there not commercial space? There is, yes. correct. And, and that's on entrances on Memorial? I believe so. Correct. Yes. So is it going to have a Memorial Drive address? Mm -hmm. I would defer to the architect on that who prepared the plans with the signage because I'm not entirely sure. We'll come back to that in a moment, if that's okay. And then lastly, um, we're seeking a variance for the maximum permitted um, 
lighting illumination. So the maximum average um, is one foot candle. Um, we are over that in the parking garage. Um, the reality of it is, is that, you know, it's typical to have, you know, an internal parking garage exceed the average of one foot candles. Um, this is really due to safety. You don't want to be in a dark um, garage. The good thing is, um, while we do exceed that lighting requirement, this is this is an internal, this is an enclosed garage. It's not like, um, you know, there's a, you know, excessive amount of exterior lighting that's spilling over property lines. It, it is going to be, for the most part, um, entirely contained within, um, you know, within the garage. And like I said, this is a safety thing when you're in a, you know, in a, a dark um, parking garage, you don't feel um, very safe. It's very difficult to, to move, maneuver, navigate, things of that nature. So that's why it's very typical to see, you know, them being over one foot candle. But it's actually open, right? It's, if I remember from the last time, there's a, it's, it's open, but then there's a retaining wall. Correct. And I think we had some comments about the height of the retaining wall so we don't see into the garage or something. Right. So I is believe there's a light going to spill out? From there? I would defer um, to Mr. Vandermark because his office, or they prepared the lighting plan, but I don't believe that there would be a light spillover. And there is, um, you know, a substantial amount of, of, you know, vegetative buffering around the site as well. Yeah, it would only be to actually... <laughs> to the Neptune border into the railroad right away. That's right. Right. Yes. Um, what was the number of the proposed foot candles? I don't, I'm not entirely sure because I don't believe that it was in the letter. I believe that the first plan, um, there wasn't enough information to determine um, how lit the area was going to be. So Mr. Vandermark actually revised the lighting plan to show the actual foot candles. Um, but by looking at it, um, we determined that it, it is going to exceed the one foot candle average. But I'm not, I, I, I don't have those calculations off the top of my head. But I'll I think we did that before the meeting. Yeah, I think the board's going to want that. Sure. Right. right. Um, so that sums up the relief. Um, so I really just want to talk about how the project's in line um, with the Springwood Ave redevelopment plan. Um, when you look at the goals, um, some of the goals are. Improve the availability of housing alternatives for residents of all income levels. I think that this is a great opportunity to do that because we have the market rate units and then we have the affordable housing units. And then within those affordable housing units, they're, they're even tiered for varying incomes and varying different types of people, varying, um, uh, you know, varying bedrooms. So when you have market rate units, affordable units, and then you have a mixture of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms. Um, people that drive, people that bike, people that walk. We're, we're crossing all of these to, to make this property available to all different types of people, which is a huge advantage. It's not all one bedrooms, everyone gets one spot and that's it. So you're not, you're not stuck. This is available to many different types of people. Um, Provide areas for active and passive recreational uses, as well as an area where residents can come together, meet each other, and foster new relationships. So you kind of have a mix of this. You have that rooftop, which is going to be private for the residents um, to hang out, get some, you know, get some air, socialize with other residents of the building. And then, you know, this area on the site, we kind of had this, um, you know, this cut in. This is kind of more of a a quasi public space where you don't necessarily have to be um, a resident. There are benches here. This could be a space, you know, <coughs> people gathering, people, you know, leave their office waiting for an Uber, waiting for a friend to come pick them up. So you do have these areas. You have these um, these active street fronts and these active street furniture um, where people really can come together and, you know, socialize, form a sense of community. Um, promote walking and bicycling as an alternative. Um, means of transit. So we have the, you know, we have the car spaces, but we also we're in well within walking distance to the Asbury train station, which is great if people um, commute by train. Um, providing these nice wide sidewalks that you know people can choose to walk around um, and walk to their destination if they choose to. And then um, lastly, we you know we have uh, I believe it's three rooms of bike storage, which is um, great. So maybe um, people that wouldn't have thought of getting a bike and, you know, would maybe even move here and say, I, I maybe don't need a, a car, 
they have these great bike storage rooms. We're gonna we're gonna have bikes and we're gonna bike around Asbury. Um, so all of these things help really push that the walkability and the bikeability that the redevelopment plan calls for. Um, and then lastly, one last goal is connect Springwood Ave to other parts of the city. Um, and I think this is great. I think that this is actually, you know, it's 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 on the other side of the tracks. You, you see a lot of development interest in Cookman, on Lake, on Bangs Ave. Um, this is one of those developments that it's just, it's in walking distance to them, but we're bringing something new to this neighborhood. And this is one of those things that can help connect the walkability, the bikeability between the area of Cookman and Banks and Lake over to this area to help keep these businesses thrive and keep um, businesses over there thriving as well. Um, so I think this will play nicely into um, the rest of the you know developed downtown area. Um, so the redevelopment plan um, allows relief under um, the C2 provision of the MLUL. And what that means is that if you take the project positives and you weigh them against the negatives, the positives should sub substantially outweigh the negatives. And if you know all of those positives um, promote the purposes of the plan, things like active street front, bikeability, walkability, um, then you can improve essentially that relief. And in my professional opinion as a planner, I think, you know, when you, um, you know, when you balance these on a balancing scale, I think that, um, you know, all those benefits do carry forth and warrant an approval for this. Uh, like I said, all those benefits, we have um, things that create an active street front, the, mix, the mixing of uses, um, promoting walkability, bikeability, um, the social aspects with this development. Um, you really, um, you have all these different activities and all these different elements happening and it really helps the street come alive. And I think that's something that this neighborhood desperately needs. And I think when you have, um, you know, activity on what's now a vacant lot, it serves as a catalyst for um, other private investment in the area and other people to come in and say, hey, this neighborhood um, is, is, you know, becoming really vibrant and really active and, you know, it, you know, improves the area as a whole. Um, so I think that, you know, the positives are, are substantial with this, and I think it's really going to improve this vacant piece of land, and it's very in line with the plan. And that concludes my direct, but I'm happy for any questions. Yeah, I, I have some questions, and, and uh, Madam Chair, you know, I, if, if uh, it's not in my daily work, you know, in my purview, but I, I had, I think it's a nice project, and, uh, and especially that we get a, an affordable housing component, but I think I asked the question about parking early on and about how that goes with the affordability. I don't know if you can answer this question. And, and also, I, I, if I understand correctly, this is an electric heat project, correct? That, that's right? Correct. And, and I assume then tenants will be separately needed for their electric heat? How does that play in with the, because I assume the affordability, you know, the, there's a legal framework for what the rents would be. Does it take into consideration as well the utilities? You know, if this was a, you know, a gas boiler where the, the, the uh, landlord supplied heat, uh, is, is that into the equation, what they're going to pay for heat as well? I don't believe so. I believe it's based on average median <coughs> income in the area. Right, but for instance, again, I say if this were a conventional natural gas mm -hmm. heated where the, where the landlord paid, you know, there was a central boiler, tenants would not be paying for heat. So your rent is X, but now it's X plus your heat. Uh, can anybody answer that question? Uh, sir, I don't, that's a fair question, and I don't know the answer at this time, although I will know that if the application gets approved, obviously it's going to have to comply with all the city's prevailing affordable housing regulations. I just don't know the intricacies of how the electric heat works with regard to the um, qualifications. I just don't know that at this time. And, and also about the parking, because that couldn't be an answer either whether, they, you know, the tenants get a free space or they charge for parking. Yes. And we'll have someone address that. We do. Uh, that was a question I was asked last time. We do have information on that. Thank you. So th there's a limitation on the gross amount of income that a tenant 
must pay, and that will include the utility tax. Okay. So what happens then if, you know, the electric heat is up and it goes above that percentage, who pays for it? The landlord. Okay. It would have to be adjusted. So it behooves them to have efficient appliances and an efficient system. I would say from a, and from a climate change standpoint, um, we're all going to have to start using more electricity as opposed to natural gas and fuel oil. I mean, they're proposing that in New York City as well. Yes. You're not talking about our grid can that support the electricity. There's that issue as well. Does anybody else have any, anybody else from the planning board have any questions that they would like to pose based on the uh, testimony? Yeah, maybe it's not this witness, maybe yeah. it's been asked and answered before. So it's 21 studios, 26 one bedrooms, 41 two bedrooms, four three bedrooms. So it's 92 units, 18 affordable. What's the breakdown of the affordables? How many one, two, and three bedrooms? We have that, um, and we need one minute answer now. One minute. Okay, that'll be answered later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then to piggyback on Dan a little bit, and we're going to talk about parking later, it's just, just to me, there's just not enough parking at this point in time. So we'll talk about that later also. Mayor, unless there's any change, the prior testimony was that there are two, there are 19 affordable units, two studio affordable, yes. one one bedroom affordable. 12 two bedroom affordable and four three bedroom affordable. So all and four three bedrooms are affordable. And a court right, and according to the testimony, it does meet the UHAC requirements. I'm not positive, and this is my bad. And I don't know if Clark Kate and Hens would know it. When we passed the affordable, I thought it was just one, two, and three bedrooms. I'm not sure if studio is qualified for affordable. No, you can use studios. They would count the same but as one. You can, but did this, is that what the council passed? No. Well, I'm what sorry, we the, one which council? Three. This council, Asbury Park City Council. Well, that I that I to, can't. to give to and I, I don't know. I apologize for not knowing, but this yeah. is a question. I don't remember us saying studios could be affordable. Could could be. I'm just throwing Under that out. The general regulations. A studio and a one bedroom count the same. Okay. It just in general, I would say in general though, uh, I haven't seen anybody propose studios in a long time. So this is the first time I've seen studios proposed for affordables in probably a decade and a half. But if it's allowed well, that would in be, your ordinance. That's pretty that, relevant yeah. here. Well, it's relevant. And at the same time, what I was going to say is that. Um, not only would the applicant have to comply with UHAC, but the applicant would have to comply with any stricter ordinance um, that Asbury Park may require, and that can be a condition of any resolution of approval. Yeah. Right, we and we would obviously, obviously comply with that. Because right, and, and I could be wrong. Well, Stuart right, could we'll be there. I just don't remember. And is the, is the percentage of affordable based upon unit or square footage? Um, it's based on bedrooms. Bedrooms? And the size of it is based on the uniform construction code, um, I know that uh, I was I was kind of a, uh, I'd like to just talk about the refuse, the shortage, because it seems significant. It does. It seems like really significant. Can you go over those numbers again? And if, if you want, I know he testified as to the nature of the relief that we think uh, we will need. I can have Mr. Ricci testify that, or I am going to be bringing uh, Jake. That's fine. I'm, I'm fine with whoever can uh, answer the question. The, I'm, the, I, the, it's OK the, if it's not. Um, I just want to make sure that on the record, I get the numbers exact. OK. So. Yeah, because you had mentioned it. Right. 377 is 1,100. Yeah. So three, you have 377. Correct. And you're required to have 1,100. That's really yeah, significant. That's, that's really significant. Okay. That, that's also a problem down the road to the city, which is down the road after this, because I just found out you guys are applying for a pilot when this is done, which has nothing to do with this hearing, but no big deal. But with the Kelly bill, 
the city has to pick up the garbage. So if we have to pick it up six times a week instead of twice a week, like because of your the size of your facility. So I mean, like where we've dealt with other developers during the pilot program and said they said we'll we'll opt out of the Kelly bill for five years and we'll pay for the garbage. Okay. And when you're looking at having one quarter of what's needed, mm -hmm. uh, that could be something down the road to just put in the back of your head. Sure. And I will have Mr. Uh, our engineer talk about that. Okay. Okay. Well, is that something we can have part of the resolution to have them opt out of that bill? Pilot has nothing to do with the planning. No. The, right. The bill we're saying. I don't know what the Kelly bill is. That something that's, that's that the city has. Well, the Kelly bill is a state law saying cities have to pay to pick up garbage from condominiums, apartments, and everything else. Where years ago they didn't have to, but now they now they have to. So when somebody's proposing a, a pilot to the city, and then, which this has nothing to do with the planning board, this would be a city thing. Well, wait a second, like you know, we, we can't put the burden on the city right. for something like this right. because of that shortage. Right. But that again, that's not. At the planning board. Sure. Right, but we still should have that discussion and they'll, they'll, it'll Agreed. come up. Okay. Anything else that. Uh... I, I just had a question. I want, what, what was your thinking of putting commercial space on the second floor? Um, so I wasn't the, I didn't design the plans. I just testified in the capacity of a planner and the, you know, the compliance with the redevelopment plan. Um, but from a planning standpoint, I do know that, you know, some second floor office space, especially, you know, fronting out onto the street, an active street front, is something that is, um, you know, looked at as, um, you know, you, you attract companies, you attract uh, people to want to move into that space because it's, you know, it, it's, it's located in an active downtown. It's on the second floor. Um, you know, it's a little bit higher up, maybe a little bit better view of, of some of the surrounding neighborhoods and areas of the city. So it is something that is sought after. Um, and I believe that the redevelopment plan does um, permit it. But as to the thinking of, of why exactly that was proposed, um, I think that maybe is more a question for the architect who did prepare the floor plans. Okay. We'll, we'll okay. have them up here. Okay. I, I have a question. I'm not sure it's for you. Uh, as part of the package that we received was a copy of a uh, current survey. And I've got some questions concerning the survey as it affects this entire lot. And, and is the, would this be the right Would he be moment? the right person to talk to? Probably not. Okay. okay. Um, but we'll, we'll bring that to the engineer and, and, then, and then whoever else we need to bring up, we'll, we'll get it. Okay. Good. Did you mention how many spaces we're going to have these seven and a half foot with? Uh, none. They're actually eight and a half. But the Asbury Ordinance does allow for a compact space to drop down to seven and a half. Okay. You don't have that size? No. Okay. I believe that there's a couple of eights up here in the corner. Okay. I think there's two. And then I believe that the rest are eight and a half. Okay. Yeah. Eight and a half by 19. So all the spaces will be technically compact spaces? Correct. We have two listed as compact because they are eight. Um, so what does that mean? You can only put a compact car in there? Uh, I think this is more of a question for the civil engineer who prepared the plan. But I have seen regulation-wise and zoning-wise, sometimes eight and a halves are compact. Sometimes they are the full size space. And compact are seven and a half or eight. So I, I've seen it both ways. It's um, what, would it, was it, what are we supposed to be for non-compact? Nine. Nine. So we're, we're essentially we're six, inches, six inches short, so three inches on each side. Mm -hmm. Make a difference getting out of your car. Are all those parking spaces uh, six inches short, even the ones that are supposed to be shared? Uh, correct. Yeah, so nine, nine feet is a requirement, um, and then they are all eight and a half feet. Is this the project with the stacker? Yes. Yeah. Fancy. Yes. Okay. 
Yes, they're not marketing to the uh, crew cab full bed driver. <laughs> Any um, any other questions from the from the board? Any questions from our professionals to the witness? If not, um, any questions from the public for this witness? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Warner Baumgartner, uh, Fifth Avenue. Um, there was testimony earlier about uh, setbacks. Uh, I'd like some clarity uh, on what you were talking about, maximums versus minimums, and where they are located. Sure. Could you uh, explain that a little better? Yeah. So, you know, in, in a lot of zoning ordinances, you have um, a minimum setback, meaning that they want to set the building back a certain amount of feet off the curb. Um, in this instance, in the plan, I think you, I think you mean off the property line. Off, yeah, off the property line. Right. Um, okay. You actually have a maximum setback, so it's between um, zero feet and fifteen feet, but they allow for zero feet for zero foot setback. In this in this development, zero to fifteen. Exactly. Okay, and and what and what have you established here as your setbacks? So because it, it seems like the property line is discontinuous here somehow. Exactly, and I think that's that's kind of why we're seeking the relief. Um, you know, if this property line, the, um, the dotted line there on the map. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's. If that did follow weird. the front, of the you know the front the building line, which would theoretically be here, we would be we would have that zero setback um, okay. that the plan. Um, you know. Okay, so the the anomaly with this site is that the street right of way has a discontinuity in it where the property line is not a straight line. On Memorial, at least. Yeah. Okay. So then it's this. So so level. let's talk about from the curb then as a as a straight line. Obviously the curb is a straight line. Right. So how far back from the curb are you? Uh, looks like we're about fifteen feet. Fifteen uh, feet on Memorial. Correct. Okay, and then on Springwood. Mm, seven and a half feet. Seven and a half. Oh, wait, hold on, that's the property line. I would say. More like five and a half feet. Five and a half. Six. Okay. So you're showing trees there. Um, tree pits are generally three to four feet, are they not? Uh, yes, they are. Okay. So what does that leave for a pedestrian walking space? <laughs> not much, right? Two to three feet. Two or three feet. Uh, minimum sidewalk widths are usually four to five feet for walkways, for pedestrians. So how do you reconcile cramming the building so close to the curb on the Springwood Avenue side and not having room for trees or pedestrians to coexist? I mean, once again, I think this kind of goes back to, um, you, you kind of have this odd shaped piece of property and you know we have to be able to fit the parking on the ground. We have to fit you know, all the retail tenants and the mixed use and everything. So you, you know, at the end of the day, um, you don't have a lot of room left over um, really to, to provide, you know, the widest sidewalk possible. I think that the applicant has made, you know, their best effort. I mean, you have a nice 15-foot um, sidewalk in the front, you know, we put wide sidewalks, you know, where we could. But I think it's a result of really um, having to fit, uh, you know, all these different things on the site. And Madam Chair, I, and uh, Mr. Baumgartner, are also our engineer can address that as well. Yeah, we're going to have to because if we're we're having the discussion of saying that we're trying to integrate, you know, walkability into town, sure. that's where you'd be walking into town, mm -hmm. right? And you don't have room to walk into town, mm -hmm. and you don't really want to cross the street because that would defeat the purpose. Okay. Uh, okay, I I think I pointed out what my uh, my what my point was. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. First floor is not inset there, is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Is it? It's somewhat difficult to tell the plan since parts of the plan are right. cantilevered and some are not. Right. Any, yeah, any, our, I'm sorry, I was going to say our engineer will address that. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions from the public? Okay. All right, thank you, TJ. Uh, may I recall? Uh, Jake Podesto, our engineer. Yeah, with the understanding that we do want to circle back to a lot of these questions we that have been brought up. Okay. 
Mr. Mazet, so you do understand that you are uh, still under oath from the prior hearings and you continue to be under oath this evening? Yes, sir. sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, did you want to go through um, your questions first that you wanted, uh, or your questions first, or your testimony? Um, I, I just, yeah, I guess we can go through some of the, the testimony. I think a lot of things I wanted to bring up were some of the open items sure. left over in the Insight uh, Review Letter, uh, dated 6 2 2022. Um, in particular, starting with uh, the survey component, there should have been a survey submitted dated 6-9-2022 by Charles Tremont. And this addresses really the comments one through five as it relates to um, providing a survey uh, with topography, the location of the survey, uh, sorry, the location of the sanitary line, uh, and then easements. On the property that was given to us, the, the title that we received, our survey confirmed as well that there are no uh, plottable easements on the property, so none have been shown in the survey. I think it's a little discrepancy uh, what the um, the engineer has uh, asked us to look at, um, and then some of the right of way improvements as well. Sorry, the right of way uh, widths have been shown within that. Uh, I do want to clarify: we will be providing a geotechnical test uh, that'll allow us to understand the infiltration rates and groundwater depths as required from an NJDEP standpoint. Um, continued clarity. Um, regarding um, the, I think that was the um, the ability for us to recharge um, into the ground uh, with in relating to the monitoring wells. So essentially, all those monitoring wells are located, we'll call it more across the Memorial Drive frontage. Um, that's the areas that we were looking at, and essentially, what's going to happen is the building will act as the cap to those contaminated soils. Um, it's going to be, we're actually at the supply to the state, get the necessary approvals um, for any remediation. It'll be an action plan for the soils. Uh, however, the infiltration system is away and will, have, will basically not impact um, um, any, uh, any person uh, that would come in contact with the soil. So essentially the building ends up at being the cap um, from an environmental standpoint. Uh, so that, that's basically, uh, we can infiltrate, it's not an issue. Um, it allows us to add uh, groundwater recharge in a situation where in a PA1, it's not required, but we're adding that anyways because we have an infiltration system. I'm sorry, did you say there were no easements? There were no easements found through the title search that was done and, and the ULTA search and the uh, title comment that was provided. So, to the so we have this concrete culvert that's at the we, southern part. That, didn't we just talk about? There was a sewer. So there, yeah, there's a 72 inch sewer main that runs essentially what we'll call is the municipal line. Um, I think the majority of it was intended to be uh, actually within um, the Neptune uh, portion of the property. However, it, it has a small, small traversion into um, the city. Um, the building is respecting that by a minimum of five feet all around the perimeter of that. We're going to ensure that there's going to be no impact to that. Um, so that's an easement. There is no recorded easement or potable easement that was found through the title being <laughs> given to the surveyor. So it just exists physically. It, it exists physically. Which is not right. recorded. And there's no recorded easement and there's some law that recognizes implied easements or yeah. easements by prescription. Yeah. But yes, exactly. we yes. look for that. But, and that's why, importantly, as Jake's saying, we, we designed to not interfere with that. Yeah, there was a lot of conversations back and forth and one protecting that, ensuring that we weren't going to interfere with that. We did all necessary ground penetrating radar. We scoped it. We do whatever we could to make sure ensure our building's not going to impact that. So that Including, should be in the resolution that it's yeah. not recorded. I mean, if it's not recorded, they don't have to legally, well, maybe. Well, they see. know it's there. If they recognize the fact that it's there, they have to, they have to so call it. it I mean, who owns here? it? Here. That is, I think it's a joint um, sewer line between the city um, and the, the town. So, so it's, 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 it is active, it. yep, and it leads out, um, you know, away from the property. Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, yeah, yeah. they'll have to comply with that, but yes, we'll, we can put something in the resolution if it's approved. And if that's not allowed. Do you get brownfield credits in New Jersey for cleaning up the site? Uh, I don't have that knowledge on that one. Um, and then as it relates to, I think there's a couple additional items that were left open, the, uh, the sewer, uh, the, the city sewer connection, we'll agree to comply with that. We'll make sure that we obtain that. Um, there's a TWA application. We do meet the threshold to require that, a little clarification there. We will obtain that through the state and have been begun that process as well. Um, the curb is a curb ramp detail for any improvements that we're making at the intersection of Memorial and Spring, um, Springwood Ave. 
So we will be also providing that detail. And then um, as it relates to the additional um, requirements asking us to provide um, information on the plans, including um, the setback modification being measured from the municipal line versus the property line, we'll agree to comply with that. Uh, and our planner has already testified on that re uh, request, which is 8.4. Uh, 18 is from the property line, 18.4 from the property yeah, line. Yeah, so, so you don't have to do that. The, the um, MLUL goes to the property line, mm -hmm. not the, not the uh, municipal boundary line. Okay. So, yeah, you don't, you don't have to do that. Yeah. We'll have the dimension. And then I, I think that was all the open items when it relates to, um, and then we'll revise our plans accordingly to any overhangs we properly show on the plans. Um, in reference to the architectural plans, which already should uh, correlate. I think there were a couple questions regarding the trash. Um, it was the one hot item coming off the top of my head. Um, 377 feet are shown on the property. Um, the 100 and, sorry, 1,014 uh, square feet of area is required when we do the calculations. This is noted to be a private hauler, so we will have complete control of the ability to take trash off. We're not asking for public health. We're taking this from a private standpoint. Um, keep in mind about a, a thousand square feet is basically the equivalency of another retail component. Um, currently on site, we just have under 14, uh, 1,300 square feet for one of our retail uh, spaces. So it would be the equivalent of basically having a separate retail space that the applicant is basically finding a betterment because they have the ability to control um, the trash uh, removal with a private hauler. So that's part of the reason and justifications um, that we're looking for um, when we have this, this request in front of you. So the intent, it's, it's been accounted for, um, but we want to activate the space across the front. That's kind of asked of us in the redevelopment plan as well. Yeah, we're gonna need to put something in to, if this does have to go to, to uh, it cannot go to city. We cannot burden the city with this. Yeah, and I, and I think we need to find out whether the city has to be burdened according to what the mayor just indicated. Right, because if that's true, then we can't. This right. is not a, that's, this is not a plan that, that'll right. work. Because that forces the city to have to Yes, and we can't do that. Collection days. We cannot do that. I don't for, think that that's fair. Are you saying that you're unable, we might be unable to have them agree not to make the city the obligation? That's correct. Yeah. 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 If the law says that the city's obligated to I, I handle think, it. I probably shouldn't have brought it up, but I, I, I don't I think the city's obligated to provide the same as they provide everybody else in town. So if there's two day a week pickup for John Moore, there'd be two day a week pickup for you guys. So if you picked it up six times, the other four times would be on you. That's the way I understand it. Okay. And the applicants are trying to ensure that there'll be no, you know, impact to the public, right. you know, through whatever they can in, in private hall and being, you know, our, our ability to do that. You don't compact this, right? You don't comp you're not compacting right? You know, I, I don't know how the extra function is going to be. I think the intent is to compact as much or, you know, wherever yes. we can. They were all compact. Yeah. Will you be testifying to the trees, Mr. Like Mo Gardner? Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll go through the, the, the list. Uh, Jake, there was a question regarding, I'm just still going in. Yeah, of the order. Uh, Memorial <coughs> Drive entrance, is that for you? Um, in what regards the, the location? I, I don't remember. Yeah, there was a question on Memorial Drive entrance, and the specific question was, I'm trying to where. I mean, it, it's as far as the Memorial Drive entrance is, I mean, I think part of the request, and I think it was really the, the loading zone, we actually, along the Memorial Drive, uh, we do comply for vehicles to get in. Um, however, along the Spring one Ave, just because the grade, grade difference has created that uh, deviation for us, if it was on the same linear plane, we'd be able to comply. But because there's such a grade difference between Springwood Ave and Memorial Drive and our two access points, that's what's driving that, that variance in that uh, relief situation when it comes to vertical clearance. Uh, question about the height of the retaining wall. Would that be for you? Or? So yeah, it's a it's a screening wall. It'd be six feet in height. Um, it'll be fully CMU block um, that will block all the lights. Um, the lights will be at 14 feet directly down from the canopy. 
Um, so it's basically, you, you would have to be essentially standing on top of the wall in order to see some of the light that would be basically <laughs> reverberating back up. Um, it's not, it wouldn't be measurable in any way. So the secondary question was, would, that, uh, would there be light spill out or adverse light no. impact? Okay. Yeah. And then there was a question regarding the foot candle measurement in the garage, one foot candle allowed. Do you know what exactly we're proposing? I don't have the exact number. I know it is within industry standards, though. It is what? Within industry standards. The, the intent is you want to have between five and ten within uh, a parking garage. Okay, and then there was... Sorry, you said between five and ten foot candles? Yes. So it's like five or ten times? No, no, no. So like a, 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 foot, a foot candle is very actually hard to see as an individual. So between a one and a two, it's actually really tough to see. A foot candle is essentially the amount of light given off by one candle, one foot away. It's, it's tough for us as engineers uh, to quantify us looking directly at a light. So it's the amount of basically generation given by this light. We talk about light generation, and that's what we're talking about. So if the naked eye to have two foot candles, it's very tough to tell. Um, there are certain requirements set forth, uh, certain standards set forth that en um, engineers use as baselines. Um, for example, in here is probably between 40 and 60 foot candles. So if you were thinking about that, we're, you know, we're essentially to half to a third um, of that uh, when it comes to within the actual garage. And the intent is to have that, you know, an even distribution of light. But we don't know, we don't know how much we exceed the average. Uh, and I, I don't have that calculation. I'm sorry, in front of me right now. And, and, and we'll, we'll be able to ride that in a little bit. But there isn't any spillage, so that it, uh, externally you will not see that light. Mm -hmm. Correct. But the, the intent is it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a request, but the average within the parking lot does exceed that one foot candles. We'll get you that number mm -hmm. to be exact, um, mm -hmm. but there's no spill. There was a question regarding the, the tree pit, pits and the sidewalk. With, yeah. And is there enough room to walk into town? Yeah, there, there is enough room. Um, so essentially there's seven and a half feet from the building to the front face of the curb, and there's another six inches of the curb. Um, so the, the actual tree well itself um, will actually not impact the necessary flow. Like, so it'll be ADA accessible basically throughout the entire frontage, uh, having between, I think in certain areas, it'll have that full eight feet basically of clearance, and you'll have four feet um, at a minimum going across the, uh, the so, front. Of so on Springwood Avenue, when we're walking Avenue. on Springwood Avenue, it's four foot clear walking. Yes. No, no. Wind, no the trees Minimum. are not impacted. Minimum. Minimum. Yep. Is that is that is a, that a, a tree a, a, grade? Are you walking on a tree grade? No, you would not. There's there's clear, be, clear, clear space between. Surface. So we, we do have some planters in there, and they've been basically situated so they do not interfere with that 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 situation. We have a tree grade, and then the building. And the insorting ordinance does require us or intends for us to be on the property line as best for possible, making sure that we still have that public engagement as you can go all the way through um, along the Springwood Avenue. And the tree pits are, where do they start at the curb or at the, the building? The uh, they, they, would, they would essentially start at the curb. They start at the curb. Yeah, and come out. So is it your uh, position that our sidewalk width will A, comply with city requirements and B, comply with ADA requirements and C, most importantly, be functional, usable, and safe. That is correct. And so the, you, but you do have some planters, but you're staggering them with yes. the treatment. Exactly. They've been tastefully staggered away to ensure that there's still pedestrian and ADA accessibility throughout yeah, the spring without punch. Are you using tree grates or anything that can be walked on or rolled on with like a carriage or wheelchair, or is this a, kind of like a hard barrier where it falls into the dirt? I think the requirement was for us to actually have a physical barrier in those locations. So there, there is, a, is a small... Extension. Yeah. Okay. So we have a lip the gate, or is it a great? Yeah, there's a small lip. Three lips, so it's four feet. Is that it? You can't go over that. Yeah. And then I believe Mr. Henry had some questions on the survey. Yes. I will say the uh, tree grates look drawn. <coughs> you talk about lot seven oh five lots one two three four, but there's on the survey there's shown another. Uh, Lot, lot five and block 506. Mm -hmm. Is that part of this application? I can answer that. that that's the, the parcel in Neptune. So, yes, it is. And we did notice for that, and we got the list from the city of uh, Township of Neptune as well. So, it is technically. The reason I ask is I try to follow the uh, outside perimeter of this particular uh, four lots. 
And it, it is so confusing because of the different different lines that you have here, the different, uh, again, I realize you didn't do the survey. And didn't and prepare just, the just what, what, what document are you looking at? Just so I can follow along as well. I'm sorry. He's looking at the survey, correct? I have the survey June 29th, 20, uh, 2022. June 9th, 2022? Yeah. So in the area of confusion. Can we bring up the survey? I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> so I think the area you're talking about but part of my problem is that I refuse to take a magnifying glass to look at these. No, that's fine. I'm trying to blow it up right now. So I think the area you're talking about is probably in this southerly location, the property plan left. So what you're looking at is actually this dashed line um, going through um, the property. That's actually the municipal border that's shown. That's that block 306, lot 5. Uh, that's located uh, within town of Neptune. Okay, so that's... Every, that... Lot five is from the municipal border uh, south. Correct. Okay. And is the municipal border the southern boundary of uh, the four lots that you are talking about in your subdivision here? No. The, the, the four lots within uh, the town are located north of that border, but this one is part, it's all one parcel, and it's, it's located south. There's a small portion that we'll call it 10 foot by um, 150 feet uh, located, you know, in a different municipality. Okay. And you just testified a few minutes ago that the, uh, the storm sewer, this uh, seven foot culvert, yep. I remember my dimensions correctly, that's mainly in Neptune? Yeah, so I, I testified to it being partially and more or less trying to straddle that municipal line. And what we've done in our, in our development well, is basically try to avoid um, that as much as possible as within five feet. So you can see it actually shown the plan in front of you, which was revised and resubmitted. Uh, it shows the da two dashed lines that essentially sh showed the limits mm -hmm. um, of that culvert. Okay, so most of it's in Asbury yeah. Park, yeah. not, not yeah. Neptune. And if you look at the global maps, essentially that, that line, the main trunk line is about 72 inches in line essentially runs the entire property line to a certain point, probably I think it's a couple thousand feet uh, to the uh, west. Um, and essentially, it, you know, it's a good of being a collector and the intent it appeared to be more or less running the border of the, uh, the two municipalities. Yeah, but, but it's in Asbury Park and not in Neptune, at, except it, for that little uh, corner in the uh, southwest uh, corner of that. A, a portion, yes, it does. I'm sorry? A portion does come into Asbury Park. Well, from this survey, the majority of it, in connection with this application, is in Asbury Park. As, as it traverses through the property. Yeah. Yeah, because this okay. is a that's large the line. The answer is yes. And that's the one that goes up to Wesley Lake. That's the yes. Okay. <laughs> it's subterranean. It's subterranean. How big is it? Uh, it's approximately three to four feet. And a, what is it? A concrete? It's a con you know, it's a concrete tunnel. Yeah. Box essentially, color? if you want to look at it, it's a concrete vault, essentially that running you know the entire property line. And what, you're sure you're not, no part of the building will be over it? Is no. There, will parking area be over it? There will be parking spaces over the top of it, yes. And where does the, this wall that uh, is being constructed in relationship to that? Uh, it'll, it'll run the perimeter um, of the property line. So there'll be a small point here and there. I believe it's actually a 10 foot section uh, on the southerly portion of the property where we'll be proposing um, that wall. We'll make sure that that pipe is as much as possible kept structural integrity, uh, structurally uh, sound as we install and do our necessary improvements on the site. So I'll think of a slab where you put over that. Um, I'll think of a concrete slab. I, I, I don't know. Um, because there's going to be cars parked on there, is that part of it? Yeah, so it, it'd be a typical section. Um, if there's any additional reinforcements, we'll obviously ensure that that's done through our structural engineer. Um, but, you know, we're, we're not at that point. Um, you know, we'll make sure that, you know, it's not going to fall in on itself. I was having trouble, as I said, I was having trouble following the uh, perimeter of the thing. The challenge, yes. Yes, and again, part of the conversations that we had was was the uh, property line limits, um, as well as ensuring that we were we were showing this uh, sanitary the sewer line uh, correctly. And then there seems to be a gore between the uh, uh, westerly uh, property line along Memorial and the uh, right of way of Memorial. Correct? 
I'm sorry, you, were you looking for exactly? It seemed to be a, a, a gore in this survey along the westerly boundary of this survey as it relates to these four lots and the easterly boundary of uh, Memorial Drive. In particular, are you talking about? And up in the left-hand corner. Left-hand corner? Right that, there you go. This right here? There and to the, right through that, that's it. So that, that's actually a separate storm line that is collecting um, the Memorial Drive uh, rainwater. Um, so you can actually see, so it's not shown here all the way the limits of the 72 inch pipe, but essentially it runs along that municipal line heading west as you plan top left or sorry, upper left. And then these collect from the street runoff, directly okay. tap into that existing manhole that's okay. on site. And they, that's those storm lines the run into that uh, the culvert. Right? Yeah. Okay. But there seems to be a... Uh, this area here? Yes. Who, who? That's, that would be the county. It's the county right of way. So you can see as you go across, and actually it's probably better if you look at the site plan. And this is, I think, part of the request. And, <coughs> And let it load. It's, I it's thought just, the county right away was parallel and at the uh, where you have your elevation, your spot elevations in the survey. Not always. No. So and that's part of what's happening here is that the right of way, it's irregular. Um, yeah. And so as much as we are, as part of it's going to be a dedication. But we're trying to correct that. Basically, if we follow the intent of the ordinance, we could build basically into the right of way. If the county didn't have something to say. Um, we would we'd be able to basically be within a foot of the uh, the curb line there. Okay. We, but this, we, this area here is all county right of way. Okay. So there's no problem with the county uh, putting your drive in there? Uh, no, we've submitted an application. We've had initial conversations with them before this project even came in front of the board regarding access to and from the property with uh, NJ Rail as well. Um, so we're, we're comfortable with the proposed access here. Okay. And the... Uh, property line of the four four lots combined along the right of way doesn't seem to be very well defined. I had trouble trying to figure out where that was. Uh, and on, which, which, on which plan are looking at? Is this still the survey? I'm sorry? Is this still the survey? Yeah. And you're having troubles following? Yeah. And, and we, we tried to pronounce it as much as we could on the site plan. Um, it's just we used a thicker line. We can, you know, well, it yeah, helps the conversation. We can, we can make sure that that line is a little bit thicker. Um, that's, you know, that's part of the problem. I'm that's, sure that that's it's trying to figure out where the, uh, the property line was along the right of way, and it gets down to this corner, and then it uh, comes into the municipal uh, boundary. The survey is mighty confusing. It's just, it's not, the situation across, across Memorial Drive, it's just a variable width right of way. So it's, it's not conventional when it comes to right of way widths. And, and part of that in our, our conversation with the county, as much as we can, we're gonna to try to correct that. Um, so I, I can't testify to, to why that line is like that. Um, that's years and years, I'm sure before I was even alive, uh, that situation was occurring. Um, but we're, as much as we can, we're trying to make this more of a conventional parcel where we have a, a unified, as much as we can unified right of way. Okay, so these these four lots, regardless of the configuration, are going to be uh, combined into one. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, any other questions from the board of this witness? Any questions from our professionals? I, I do have a couple of questions. So, Mr. Modesto, you indicated that you had spoken to the county about um, the access. Did yes. you speak with them about the right of way? Uh, yes, that, that's actually indicated to us that they would want a dedicated at least 25, a 28 foot uh, wide right of way from the center line. And so that's where we began this conversation and it dictated a lot of how we laid out the site. So, so that, that so, was conversation one. Okay, so perhaps to help the board, can you show with your arrow approximately, why don't you show first the right of way line that you're talking about. So, so essentially what we were going to be doing is dedicating a portion similar to this, a small sliver, uh, continuing basically what is the primary frontage where it's more conventional here at the Spring, uh, Springwood uh, Ave, 
and Memorial Drive intersection and then continuing that straight through. The county is going to keep their right of way in the location um, basically where it's no longer 28 feet. They will continue to have that where we then still comply with the zoning code. Um, and then the, at this point, I believe there's an indentation. Uh, we, we don't have the right to dedicate that, but that, that's essentially the right of way across Memorial Drive. Okay, so that, that red line that you just threw, threw in there, that's going to continue uh, parallel to the building from the corner of Memorial Springwood? Yeah, so that's that, where the that, dedication is? Yeah, basically that area, and if you're looking at the page north, um, would be dedicated to the county. It is shown on the survey, uh, just showing that dedication in a dotted hatch. Uh, it says C note three. Um, that's also shown there. So again, it's an odd shape to call it like a, almost a, a sawtooth to the property. We're going to be correcting that. All right. And then there's a dimension there right in the middle of the red line. What's that dimension? Uh, that is uh, 4.9. Or sorry, 14.9. Okay. So we're talking about this one right here. Yeah. So, so, so it complied with it. Where, where does it not comply with the 15 foot? Uh, so it actually basically from this line south. Um, it, it, would, it would be from here south. Okay. Yeah. So anything beyond yeah. 15 foot on that? Yeah. You can, see, you can see it just because of the odd shape. It's so your expectation is you're going to have to do a dedication, you're going to comply anyway. Exactly. But the application it hasn't been done. We really haven't gotten that dedication through, so the request is for the variance right now. Okay. And um, your planner testified in the corner, if you go back to that south corner, uh, the south corner. South, south corner. Um, there's a rear yard setback request? Yep. Where's the area of the rear yard setback? It's in this location here. Okay. I'm circling that. I'm just going to circle it in red on one of the plans. So it's, it's this dimension here at 18.4. Okay. And at what point does it get to 20 feet? Uh, essentially, we'll call it 10 feet beyond. So that would be right after the compact parking spaces. So I'm going to draw that same line. It's essentially it's a small <coughs> configuration. So you look at it from a grand scheme of things, we'd say about you know 80 to 90 percent of the building would comply uh, with that setback. Okay, and, and then go to we, we did dedicate areas. <coughs> and continue down that corner. It, so it looks like the property jogs again. Yep. The line that's compliant there. At yep. Where it jogs? This, this complies. As well. Okay. And then if you can go to the Springwood side. So. The tree boxes you, you indicated seven and a half feet is the from from the from the curve from the face of the face of the curve to the building. Okay, and then the planter boxes are four feet. Correct. So that's three and a half feet from the face of the curve. So then you still have the curve as well, which is another 0.5. But but the planter box is six inches off the curve. Uh, that is correct. Yes. And that's another four feet. Uh, yes. So yeah. the planter box is four and a half feet off the curve. Yeah, I'm going to get that dimension exactly on the uh, the planter box, but. So then it's three feet clear to the face of the building. Yeah, we just want to make sure we're, we're right with our clearance to the building. Yeah, it's three and a half feet. Yeah. It's three, it's three, it's three, it's three and a half feet. Unless you make the planter boxes smaller and you make them more rectangular. Like longer. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we couldn't do. I don't think there's any problem with us ensuring that there's four feet um, going to the smaller, you know, smaller planter box uh, across the right of way. Yeah, it's a soil volume. That's yeah. important. So yeah. if you if you make them if you're you're cutting the width, make them longer yeah. just to maintain the proper soil volume of yeah. trees. It could be done that way. Yeah. And we're we're going to ensure four feet. So if that comes to a three and a half foot, you know, or a three foot tree grade, that's not a problem. They they do come in those configurations. And the other question I had is it looks then like the only the area of the building where you might have the right of way encroachments encroachments on the upper floors then is the south west corner. Southwest corner. Are we talking down in this location? Yes. Nope. That would. There's. There's still the ability. Um, there's no encroachment. Are we, are we talking into the right of way? Yes. Nope. There. That will completely comply. Yes. Okay. So, could, in our report, there's some discussion. Maybe that's been addressed. So I, I think the cut area we were talking about is actually along Springwood Ave. There was, uh, I think, some inconsistencies between the plans uh, regarding the, the overhang. Oh, yeah. That, that, has, been, that has been correct, corrected. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. So testimony is there's no, there are no encroachments from any of the upper floors as that, well that as the yes. ground. Yeah. That's been correct. Okay. 
when you put that driveway in on Memorial, mm -hmm. are you going to have to relocate any of the storm sewer? Uh, no, not this time. I think maybe one of the inlets may need to be reset, but it's not being relocated. It appears from the survey, and again, the driveway is not indicated on the survey, but mm -hmm. it appears that your driveway is going to be right over that, uh, that catch basin. Yeah, yeah. And, and so whatever it ends up being is when we're going to make sure that that catch basin still functions as it does today. So from a vertical standpoint, we may change the actual grade or the grade configuration, but it will still be there uh, in totality. The location is not changing um, generally as it sits on the, on the street right away now. Okay. I just wonder whether or not the, uh, the driveway might have to be shifted based on... Uh, yeah. I, I, I think we'd probably move the drain before we move the driveway because the, I think the access here from what the county directed us to have okay. is this is... This is as far as away from the intersection we can be. Professionals, any other questions? Go ahead. Just a couple quick points of clarification. Uh, you mentioned the LSRP involved, and just wanted to confirm that you can provide documentation that uh, the site is suitable for infiltration. Yep. Uh, we, in the proposed location. We will provide that. We spoke in depth today um, with LSRP. Um, confirm that it shouldn't be an issue. Infiltrations away from. Uh, the areas that are being monitored, which are along Memorial Drive. Okay. Regarding the tree grade, I understand that the tree grade itself will be ADA compliant? Correct. And can you provide a detail for that on, we, the, on the site plan? We will. And four feet of sidewalk will be maintained? That is correct. And that is the requirement, the, the ordinance requirement is a four foot wide sidewalk. Um, regarding the survey, I know we had a, I think it was our first comment. Yes. In the package we received, I remember seeing a, a file labeled as the survey. Uh, but every time I tried to open it, it was a text file. Um, but I do see that one was submitted, so as, as long as I get a copy of that, um, we should be okay there. And then finally, this wasn't in our report, just something I, I noticed um, somewhat recently. If you go to the survey on Memorial Drive, there's an existing utility pole, um, kind of upper hand, up, uh, upper left hand corner. It's, it's right here, as we're talking here. Yes. Yeah. And then on the proposed conditions plan, it's labeled as to remain. It, it's in the middle of the sidewalk. It, it looks like there's four feet on it. You know, maybe you can confirm on, on either side uh, to maintain that four foot width. But it's just something I wanted to bring up to the board that, uh, you know, it is, it is in the middle of the sidewalk. And I think it would look kind of odd and, um, you know, could inhibit some, some of the pedestrian circulation in that area. Is the is it proposed to remain, or is that going to be relocated at all? Um, the intent would be for it to be relocated. I think we're going to have to have certain spacing um, from our building as well. Um, it's, we're going to have to work with the providers. I can't give any details on where it's going to be, because they dictate quite a bit of that conversation. Um, so as much as possible, we're trying to find to make sure we have proper separation, both from the sidewalk standpoint and then a building separation standpoint. Okay. There are certain OSHA requirements from spacings. Mm -hmm. So it would hopefully be moved towards the curb. That that would be the intent. Yeah. So that the distance between the spans would remain the same. I, I'm not quite sure, but I think that would be our intent. Uh, we leave it to the utility providers. Does the board have any not moved off the front? Thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, wow. if you leave it to the utility provider, don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I. I appreciate what you're saying. You really don't have control over that. But uh, if you want that done within the next century, uh, you better get an application in about two years ago. So what options do we have for that as a board? To Well, I think the plans can be revised to show that the intent is to relocate the utility pole. Okay. 
Subject to approval from the provider. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? You okay with that note? Mm -hmm. Is it a lamppost or electrical utility pole? Anything else? Is, is that something that probably can do? I doubt that. No, I think it's just the one. I don't know. Sure. It actually is um, it's on the other side. So it's along Memorial Drive? Just along Memorial Drive. Might have to rethink the trees. Yeah. We're, we're going to, yeah. We're going to, that's what street trees are for, is we try to keep them low. And we're going to, again, that's why working with providers, it's going to be a part of the conversation. Any other questions of this witness? Um, I guess maybe there's just one thing just for clarity for the compact parking spaces, eight and a half is being proposed. It is pretty common what we're seeing for residential um, parking spaces, just for clarity. Your typical Honda Accords, about six feet in width. Um, so there is the ability to open uh, your doors. I do have a, a truck and I park in an eight and a half foot parking space. You, you can fit it, uh, it's tight, but there is the ability to fit. Um, Eight and a half foot parking spaces too. It's, it's really uh, more suited for residential uses, anyways. Um, essentially, it's you know a larger commercial uh, space. We have like a nine foot parking space um, to allow for customers coming in and out. Residential eight and a half is appropriate because people know about that. They're not going to be flying into the location. They know their destination. They know their parking space. They'll be able to pull um, slowly into their space and, and be able to maneuver as needed because they're they're going to be doing it every day. James, what are your thoughts on that? So eight and a half is, it's not terrible. Um, obviously we prefer nine, but eight and a half is pretty manageable. The only concern I would say is that there, you know, the majority of people drive SUVs and trucks now. You, you mentioned the Honda Accord, but like, mm -hmm. the majority of the cars in here are gonna be SUVs. Um, they should fit fine, it's just going to be tight. It's probably something that the residents have to think about when they want to move in, but it shouldn't be too unreasonable. I would be, I'd be okay with it. Okay. Any other cons questions or concerns from our um, professionals? I would say that um, we'll have to rethink what the tree, the street trees are along Memorial Drive with the overhead utilities along there. Because it looks like you'll have direct conflict with what's proposed, which are essentially red maples and honey locusts. You know, you'll need something, I think, that's a much more narrower rowing mm -hmm. habit. Tree. Well, that could be that could be but a that condition that's based on discussion with CCH. It could certainly be coordinated with us as yes. resolution mm -hmm. compliance. Okay. Was Any other? I was going to say, was it mentioned at the last meeting? I can remember. Uh, is, is the parking lot also available for people who are uh, patrons of those businesses on the front side? That is correct. So there are people using that on residents. Correct. Yes. And there, there was really obviously the, the stackers and these essentially set aside for residents. Yeah. But there are designated spaces for those visitors, then, right? Or is it any space? Uh, it would be it would be any space. We 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 put together a plan um, for the areas that would be allowed for uh, the commercial component. Um, that's centrally located by the commercial uses, with the uh, basically the perimeter being outside a few EV parking spaces uh, being set forth for the residents. Anything else from our professionals or from the board? Any questions from the public? Come on up. Hello, uh, Warner Baumgartner, Fifth Avenue, city historian. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about that southern lot where the municipal line goes through the lot. Uh, it kind of begs the question to me as to who has jurisdiction in that area. Have you applied to Neptune for any of these applications? I'll, I'll explain. I'll, I'll explain. Yeah. So, so the entire lot encompasses not only the four Asbury lots, but also the fifth Neptune Township lot. Mm -hmm. The applicant has made a uh, submitted a letter to Neptune Township if they have any concerns, and they received a reply back. It's part of the, the board's package that says that they do not ha have any objections and they are not required to go to Neptune Township. Okay, great. Um, but then that also begs the question as to how do you divvy up the tax payments? That's between Neptune Township and Asbury Park as to how that how that works. I don't know if there's already an agreement in place with respect to that. Yeah, I'm wondering. 
the bulk of this is going to be in Asbury Park and the bulk of the improvement is going to be uh, absolutely land. absolutely but um, shouldn't there be an interlocal agreement to establish uh, a fair division of tax revenue as part of this application I don't yeah. I, I don't believe so no I, I mean and, and the, 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 the city and the township work and I just I don't know the, the, the method of the formula you would next no, I mean, they, they assess their the property portion? for what development is on it. They agree? And uh, Asbury Park assesses its park. So, I mean, it's Do we know that, or is that, that just conjecture? That's, just, that's how it happens. That's, that's how it happens. So currently there are two tax bills generated for that lot, for sure? Yeah, that's how, that's how, that's how it works. Okay, all right. Can, can, I, say, can just, I say for sure? No, nobody can say for sure okay. without seeing the bill. That's what I'm saying. Uh, but yes, yeah. that's generally how it happens. Right. I have tons okay. of clients of, of my my own who have lots that straddle the lines and they get taxes. And taxes. Yeah, because that, that's kind of relevant to the application since we're making improvements on the Asbury side and uh, Neptune would be getting a part of that. So, okay, anyway. No, um, Neptune will not get a part of the improvements on, in Asbury unless there's some other yeah, agreement. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to the uh, the Springwood Avenue um, side there with the, uh, the, the setback and the tree line and the sidewalk and all that. Um, from what I'm hearing is there's about seven feet from the building to the curb. And now you're proposing to put trees in a, a part of that area with tree wells. Um, is there a requirement to put trees on that block frontage? There are, yes. Hmm? Yes, there are, yes. I said yes. Th there's a requirement. Yeah, it's part, okay. of, it's part of the redevelopment. Um, and would you say that a pri the priority for the sidewalk would be pedestrians or trees? Um, I mean, it's functioning as a sidewalk for pedestrians. Okay. Uh, it's, part of the, it's part of an overall streetscape plan. Okay. It incorporates both sidewalk and landscaping. So it's kind of almost one, you know, okay. this conversation. It's like if you have a pedestrian walking down just seven and a half feet of just pure concrete, uh -huh. uh, it's a little different than having a seven and a half foot concrete with a breakup and you have like the landscaping, the shade above, it's part sure. of the plan. It's required. So, so you're saying every place there's a tree, there'll only be three feet no, for we, we, we people to walk by? We clarified that there will be a minimum of four feet provided in all locations throughout the frontage on Springwood Avenue. Four feet. Four feet. With part of that four feet being over the top of the street grade? No. No. No, we, we, will, we will comply Okay. make sure that there's four feet of sidewalk area. Okay. Just from, from a logical point of view, would you agree that it would make more sense to just eliminate the trees and put two foot wide flower planter boxes along there? Um, I, I think it's the same. Um, I actually it's like the same? How would that be the same? I, from a, a sidewalk access standpoint, I, I like the trees a better person when it's a requirement from the redevelopment. Plan and two provides canopy and shade uh, okay. breakup. I think that's a, a huge conversation. Um, you walk a lot of sidewalks. Basically, street canopy trees mm -hmm. provide a relief for pedestrians walking um, through this area. Again, we look at this in the oh. gateway uh, okay. situation. It's going to help bring people right. to and from uh, the, the train station. Oh, okay, I can appreciate that. Um, do people walk single file, one behind each other, typically? Uh, I, I don't know if I can talk about how no? single file. Do, or do people walk side by side, typically, if they're walking? <laughs> okay. What, what's what's on that? What's on the face of that building uh, on that first floor? Are there commercial storefronts there, or what's actually on that frontage? So frontage along Springwood Ave that actually has basically parts of our driveway access point, a commercial space, and then the residence lot. Oh, there is a commercial space. Yes. Right. You just said that. Yep. Oh, okay. And is there a door into that commercial space? There is, yes. Does it open out or in? In. It opens in? I don't think that's code. I think it has to open out, doesn't it? I, I, don't, I don't know building code. I, I defer to the architect if that's something that comes up. Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there's any uh, doors being opened into the public right away. So from an access standpoint, um, ADA requires uh, a certain threshold when it comes to a width. And we're going to be providing that okay. regardless of the street. No, I'm asking about doors opening into the public right away. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm clarifying it because ADA requires an area regardless of the swing of the door to be provided. Um, and we will be providing that. It's required um, 
by it's basically a federal code and, and, and I believe local code as well. Uh, okay. Uh, All right. And, and you still think it's a good idea to have trees and tree pits? I, I do. I think the redevelopment speaks about it. And I think what we're doing is, okay. is in line with, with that. But, All right. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from the public? I have to I have to admit that that uh, I mean I, I I pass by that area practically every day. I think that it's personally I think it's deceptively looks large. I can't imagine that there could be forced trees there and a driveway. So I tend to agree with Mr. Baumgartner that it it just seems like there's having trees in addition to a sidewalk, in addition to a driveway, seems excessive for that short of a space for me. I don't know if anybody else agrees with that, that, that pa passes by there every day, but it just seems like there's, there's, there isn't that much room in order to be able to have people walk, have trees, and have a driveway. In, indoors. I'm, indoors. I agree. I, I agree with you. I, I'm I'm struggling with that, but um, but I'm certainly not a planner. I'm certainly not a landscape architect, but it's just a feeling that I have. Well, what is, what is the Springwood Avenue redevelopment plan called? Trees, how many feet apart? One tree every fifty linear feet of frontage. And how, how many much, feet yeah. of? How much furnish do we even have on that? Uh, from the railroad track to the corner can't 100, be. 148 mm -hmm. linear feet. Really? So you only need three. Yeah. We would need three, yes, we're proposing four. I, I don't know. If, yeah, we can eliminate one. It's, um, it's the length of the football field. Yeah, the big blue building. Yeah. And then you have the empty space. That's right. So it's 300 feet long. So it's, it's, it's long. long. Wow. It's and long. 150 feet deep. It's deceiving. Okay. And I think we, four are proposed, three are required if it's the pleasure. Yeah, no, it, it, it should be whatever the, whatever the redevelopment plan states is, is if fine. If the redevelopment plan says they only need three. Three, right. Okay. Any, uh, okay, you have another, uh, another yes. idea? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and real briefly, I'd like to call Anthony, our uh, architect who was previously sworn. There's just a couple other questions that some of the board members have to provide answers to. Okay. Uh, Anthony, just state your name. And that is Anthony C. Vandemort, Jr. And uh, again, you were under oath at prior hearings and you agreed to be under oath this evening. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Anthony, just uh, very briefly, I know there was a question on. Um, regarding the breakdown of the affordable units. And I, I think you said uh, yes when uh, the, the attorney indicated. So you, you're okay with what the attorney indicated, correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. And, okay. and the question of whether there's a studio or one bedroom, um, it, apparently the way it reads is that it's either or. Mm -hmm. um, but again, whatever the board uh, would like to mandate, uh, we will reach it. And we will certainly comply with the, the city's regulations. That's correct. Uh, I know there was, um, uh, Councilman Clayton had a question regarding uh, why we have a commercial space on the second floor. Do you have any information on that? It, 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 it is uh, uh, a conditional, uh, not even a conditional, it's a permitted use uh, within the redevelopment plan. Um, and the owner thought that uh, providing office space at the second floor, uh, that there would be a need for that. So it, it was part of the program of the project. And it's also part of the redevelopment plan uh, in, in language, so uh, we are complying with that. Does it make it, was it harder to incorporate it than not to incorporate it? Like what would be the pros and cons? Uh, no, actually it, 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 it's, it's a lot probably easier to provide um, than residential. Um, you know, uh, you could probably put in an additional 10 residential units in that location. Um, so I, I don't really think that uh, it, it was a point of uh, harder or, 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 or less than hard. I think that uh, this is something that the ownership actually wanted. What would that do to your parking lot if you had more residential units? Uh, it would probably, it would increase the number of, uh, of parking spaces required. And, and what, you would not be able to comply or? Well, I, it, it would probably, it would trigger a, a balancing of the whole entire parking garage once again. But you know, when we had a program 
and we then designed to the program that was designed on the floors above. Um, if I had 10 more residential units there, I probably would have had to provide more mechanical parking or less commercial or retail space on the first floor. So this stuff all gets balanced one against the other um, to the project you see here. I know there were uh, some uh, questions about uh, parking and is, is the parking going to be charged or do you have any information in that regard? Uh, parking is, is not going to be charged. Um, parking is going to be uh, with the residential units themselves. And just going back to the parking stall dimensions, the majority of the shared parking stalls, um, just to correct some, some testimony, we do have nine foot parking stalls uh, in, in at least 50% of the shared parking spaces. So that's a nine uh, by 19 uh, fully compliant parking stall in the yellow uh, north page here, as you can see on the monitor. And so refreshing my memory, do we have parking? Is there part enough parking for each unit or no? Yes, yes. So you will charge, there will be no assigned parking with the first, you, know, you come in first come, first serve. First come, first serve. Yes, and, and if we can just go back to the discussion uh, once again about the, the size of the uh, trash and, and uh, refuse room. Um, again, the owner uh, has agreed uh, um, uh, of certainly not going back to the city at, at any point for any additional carting services. But as mentioned previously, this is going to be an independent carting uh, service that takes away the trash and recycling. Uh, we had agreed uh, at, at the moment at you know, three times for uh, the trash itself and then twice for recycling per week. Um, you know, if, if, if the board uh, uh, still should see that this room should expand, uh, you know, something has to give at that point and then retail space number two inherently would just get smaller. Um, so uh, again, uh, we think the room is properly sized with the compactor. Uh, if the board sees uh, fit that it needs to be an additional Two to three hundred square feet. We can reduce the retail number two uh, by that dimension. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think those were the gist of the questions, at least that I had. I tried to write down as many as I can from the board, from the board members. Wasn't there something about putting more color in the I'm, 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 I'm glad you asked. Okay. So um, originally, I think the word was pop, pop of color, the, 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 yes. And the original uh, design intent of the project, uh, we had talked about uh, a vertical element and we had talked about pedestrian plaza at the corner that had to be a minimum of 15 by 15. Uh, we went back and forth about the horizontal element, uh, you know, with the indentation of the pedestrian plaza at the corner. So we went back and looked at this a little bit further, not only uh, for the color itself, but we look also at a vertical element that Commissioner Henry uh, was talking about originally. Um, so, you know, we, we felt in, in, in one sense that we, we did satisfy the, uh, the redevelopment plan uh, kind of language of what the intent was, um, but also to go a little bit further, we looked at this a couple of different ways now. We talked about uh, a vertical element. So we did bring up the corner uh, open element. Um, and then also what we did was in the reveal of the corner. Have we seen this? This is an exhibit, by the way. Okay. This is, again, uh, this is not as part of your package. This is something that's just an exhibit in uh, kind of indirect line to what Commissioner Henry had requested. Uh, and, and we studied this for the past month. So this is the uh, original uh, uh, color assemblies uh, with a vertical element at the corner with the pedestrian plaza still remaining with no roof cover because uh, I thought that would be best. This is what it would look like in the evening uh, with the raised corner. And then we have studied you know, the corner a little bit further by actually lightening the color palette with more color pop. Um, so we went to a, an orange brick uh, modular masonry with the blue reveal uh, in the corner 
And again, you have the blue that peaks out uh, you know, at the balcony spaces. And that would be uh, the proposed exhibit, would be a, a kind of a brighter color change uh, and a raised element at the corner uh, to respond to Mr. Henry's questions about the vertical element. If the board was inclined to, to want that. That's correct. Uh, can you uh, to toggle, if you would, between your darker and your lighter colored brick in the daytime shot? Yes. Sorry to be so specific. So this is the darker? This is the darker version. Um, however, the corner, uh, uh, we have added color to the corner. <coughs> to the original design, if I can show everybody the original design, had masonry on the inset at the corner. And then we actually changed the material to match the inset of the balconies at the corner now to create this colored element uh, with a raised vertical. So th this is the original color palette. Um, is that a metal panel? That is a, uh, a cement board panel. Cement board panel, yeah. And the new proposed uh, colors with uh, greater emphasis uh, of, of the orange and the blue with the elevated corner here. Um, personally, I think the addition of the color on the corner is is nice. I think something to differentiate yeah. it a little bit, it pulls it out. My one, you know, for your consideration, I'm curious if these side panels in the blue could match your rear panel just because the as you're coming down the street what you're not going to see is the face so the sides will help i think if it it, it will draw attention to that i think and tie it because those blue insets exist all the way down the building that's correct, correct. Right. so i think as as you're moving along the street, I think you're more likely to see the perpendicular side, the returns. Yeah. yeah. So if you would consider that, I think that would be all that's needed it, it, with with this to kind of pull everything together and some commonality along the facade. Well, both differentiating and common in a way. I if if. if if the board would make this a condition of approval, I would certainly agree to that. Um, what about the thoughts about the the lighter brick as opposed to the other? I, I prefer the lighter brick. Yeah, I think, yeah. That, yeah, I think <laughs> I'm not sure if it's the lighting of the rendering or the lighting of the brick. I, I, but I, I, you know what it was is that I think the original intent was that the the white portion of the facades was supposed to be the star of the show behind this kind of kind of muted color palette, and then now. You have just uh, you know a lot of different colors kind of put together here that I, I think orange and blue actually work very well together. So yeah, I, I, I think this is an improvement. I, I I agree. This is an improvement. The color palette is more vibrant. And, and the and the uh, the night the night version of that. Yes. I really like how that 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 shows because that. You're, once you're coming down Springwood, to come to that corner in the evening or on the sides, I, I, I like that. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, I don't think we uh, marked that in. Should I mark No, I think we should mark that in. I think we are in um, A4. Is that correct? I'm in A3. I have A3 as well, Irina. Right, that that lighting on all of the the top and the corners, and just to make sure that. Um, what what do you have for A three? I have color rendering. Okay. All right. So, uh, Anthony, can you just let's mark this as, as A four. Just identify what A four is. Uh, we have uh, it can either be two, three A fours. Two A4s or one A4 or one A5. One could be the daytime uh, revised colors with revised corner, and then the uh, the, A, the A5 could be the dusk uh, rendering 
uh, with the revised color palette and corner. And are they both um, prepared by your office? That's correct. And just uh, for the record, um, Mr. Lamborn, Lambert's point from the earlier uh, meeting, what, what's the real color? What, what, what name and colors are we using? <laughs> well, it's not the Booth Bay Blue that was just recently discussed. It, this, this one's called uh, Evening Blue, which is slightly darker than the Booth Bay Blue. Okay. And are those um, for marking A4 and A5, are they dated? Oh, they, they, they are fresh off the presses uh, today, 7-Eleven. And that tree that's there, is that's going to be real. That tree that's going to exist. <coughs> that tree in the middle, that's the center that, that's, that's, that's the intent. With the up lighting. Okay. <laughs> is the down lighting under the white portion? Because you know, the, the masonry first floor is, seems to be lit up. Is that... Is that just from the lights on the? Uh, That's just from the lights, lights on the building and yeah, it's down. Yeah. And they're just down lighting, yeah. That's correct. It's just down lighting. Although it looks like it's lit above windows. Well, that, uh, that's probably from the interior lights. But then there's also up lighting. There's up lighting at the at the corner, at the yeah. at the base. And Irina, we will make sure that you get a copy of A four and A five. Yes. So, Mr. Mr. Vandermark, I did have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, so we're looking from this perspective on the left side. We have the um, we have the spring um, gosh, springwood uh, springwood uh, ships side, um, and the it wasn't I wasn't sure when we were looking at the plan view on the engineering drawing. Is that front face of the wall is that seven and a half feet from the front face of the curb? That's correct. Okay. Seven and a half feet, eight eight feet to the outer curb line. Okay. So it might actually be inset slightly. Uh, when we're looking at the plan, it wasn't because the, as you can see that the second and third floors are and portions of the fourth floor are forward of that building line the street. Correct. Um, so I was just wondering if we're actually might have a better situation for pedestrian traffic on that side because that first floor is set in slightly. First floor at, at the moment is currently designed at property line though. The, 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 the white portions that you see in the upper part of the building is a two foot bay projection uh, into the right of way which are gonna require a franchise. The okay. redevelopment plan permits up to five feet of cantilever mm -hmm. into the right of way. So to answer that question, Okay. Red zero lot line plus two. Okay. So <clears throat> that contradicts slightly prior, in, testimony. In prior testimony. Yes. But um, thank you for clarifying that. What <clears throat> I'm going south on uh, Memorial from the corner. Um, you have the brick facade, the storefronts there. Yes. What percentage of that? Uh, Yes, at, at, at the at the moment of, of filing, it was at 29%. But our last conversation was, we were certainly going to uh, open up those window openings, uh, uh, you know, to increase uh, the glazing uh, at both the Springwood Avenue facade and then also Memorial Drive. Now, a lot of these facades at the base do not have, uh, you know, retail and or uh, lobby. A lot of these are different kind of functions of the building. Um, but we will put translucent uh, glazing at those locations. But again, uh, as I testi testified to previously, uh, uh, when you had asked that question, that I, I will expand the window openings to the base of the building. Okay, so you're doing? Yes. Yeah. So that facade will continue on? Yeah, you'll, you'll get a, a really nice kind of even ribbon of window uh, okay. opening at, at the building base. Which kind of falls in line with you know the language in which the redevelopment plan uh, wants between base, middle, and, and top. Does the brick stop there, or does it pick up again as it goes further south on the ground? On the, uh, the, the brick picks up as you go further south. So that there is a uh, an alternating pattern between, you know, the the white touching ground, um, and this is all within our property now because of, again of the of the setback due to the right of way dedication. 
So the white planning is not into the right of way on Memorial? And not at all. Any other questions? Are you certain about that? Yes. Okay, because when you get kind of narrows together the southwest corner, and if it's two more feet, we have that two feet at the very southwest corner of if the it, survey. If, it's, if it slightly touches, we could we could pull it back. Uh, it, as you don't, I mean, I just want to know. I, you have the ability to do that. It just. Uh, okay. I do. So you got two feet. I do. Um, actually, the. No, you know what happens is the building stops short of the of the actual property line, so yeah. we should still be within our property boundary there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, sure. I don't know if it's you or somebody else. Okay, so go back to the. 21 studios, 26, one bedroom, 41, two bedroom, four, three bedroom. But you have listed many one bedroom and den, two bedroom and den, and the one bedroom and den square footage is almost the same as the two bedroom. The two bedroom and den is almost the same square footage as the three bedroom. So are these two bedrooms and den really going to be three square footage and you're beating the parking system? Well, that's that's not the that's not the intent at all. The the no, it's not the intent. No, is that what is that what's going to happen? The, the, the reason why you actually technically it's a den is because it, it doesn't have light and air. It doesn't have windows. Um, so you know you have sometimes you have space that's left over in a floor plan that's at a and in this building in particular it's a very awkward shape. You have a lot of space that's kind of inboard of an exterior wall system. So the, these dens really technically can't be used as a bedroom by code, okay? They can be used as an office. Uh, okay, as long as that's part of the... Yeah, you, you can't, you need two means of, uh, you need two means of ingress, egress for a bedroom. Okay, so you have to have a door all part of the resolution, I have no and problem. So the uniform construction code requires that. You can't stop someone from using it as a bedroom, but it's illegal. Right. Any other questions? Any questions from the public on this testimony? Yes. Thank you, uh, Warner Baumgartner, Fifth Avenue. Uh, could you put up uh, one of the architectural renderings there? Um, I, I like the one that showed the northeast corner, I think it would be, the, like two removed from where you just were. There was a nice uh, picture, like from the railroad side. We have the railroad side. And then we have the... Uh, yeah, that one there. Yeah, blow that one up for Correct. a second. Yeah. I mean, this kind of exemplifies what I'm going to bring up. I'm, and I'm wondering, um, once again, why there's no uh, architectural treatment of the top edge of the building via a cornice or a parapet wall to indicate the top of the building. It's just a square edge, effectively. Any reason why you don't have cornices anywhere on this building? Yeah, this, this building is a, a contemporary building in nature. Contemporary? It, it's contemporary in nature, and it, it, it does not require to have a courts. It's not something that fits. Well, a lot of things aren't required, but uh, wouldn't it be nicer with a nice cornice at the top? There? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Any other question? Would you be willing to put cornices on the building to make it nicer? No. <laughs> no? no? Okay. Um, what does the development plan call for in terms of architectural standards? Is a question for me? Yeah, yeah, you're the architect. It, it, it requires a building base, a, a building middle, and a building top. Right. It does not specifically. And a top. What, what constitutes a top? An end point, right? A top floor. Via a cornice? Not necessarily. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, I have no uh, further witnesses. I have a two-minute uh, summation at your convenience. Okay. Well, we have to open a public comment if, uh, okay. if, there's no, if there are no other questions. We didn't close questions. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't open uh, 
We did open questions. <laughs> did, did, isn't that what we wanted to say? <laughs> yeah, they did. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now we're going to open uh, open for public comment. Can I get a motion? So okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, yeah. Warner Baumgartner, uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, City Historian. Uh, Mr. Beekman? Yep. Mr. Baumgartner, you <laughs> swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, nor normally I'm a big fan of following the plan, you know, whatever the plan is, redevelopment plan. But there are some cases where it just does not make sense. And this edge of the building to the north along Springwood Avenue makes no sense at all. Um, there's just not enough room to cram all that stuff onto a seven-foot strip of concrete between a building and a curb. Um, that's a perfect spot where you should really just put like little two-foot wide planter boxes along the curb and leave lots, lots of concrete for people to walk by and not get smacked by a door opening into the public space. Um, I would say you really should eliminate those trees and allow maximum space for people to walk. That's a major transition between east and west, right? It, it's common sense. So that's my first comment. The second is what I just brought up, and that's the architecture. Um, you know, whether something's contemporary or not really is not relevant. Buildings traditionally have components, a bottom, a middle, and a top. And the top usually stops your eye from like just floating off into space. And that seems to be the trend these days with these box-like structures, right? Right angles, they're easy to build. And even a contemporary building, is, is benefited a lot by having traditional architectural components. And a cornice is one of those things, as I mentioned. A parapet wall is one of those things. Or a soffit and fascia is one of those things. Um, it makes it look less like just a box, basically, a factory kind of construction. So uh, that's my two comments. The, the, North Street frontage. You know, picture this. Five foot is the accepted modern day standard for a minimum walkway width. That's so two people can walk side by side, and that assumes on ground with space to either side. So you have room for arm swing. Two people walking side by side, and their feet are up against the edges, and there's room for their arms to swing. Okay? So now you're cramming this down to three feet or even three and a half. That's just not enough space when you're up against the building on one side and two people can't possibly walk side by side if you're walking with a companion. I've heard ADA mentioned, yes, the minimum ADA standard is three feet. That's for a doorway to put a wheelchair through. That has nothing to do with a public sidewalk, essentially, and making it comfortable for pedestrians. Think of pedestrians now coming at each other both ways, in pairs. It's just not going to work. You need to do something with that north uh, sidewalk there and, and make it more people and pedestrian friendly, regardless of what the plan says. This is a case where this is an anomaly where you only have seven feet to work with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, and, uh, can I get a motion to close public comment? So, Thank you. All sure. in favor? Uh, public comment, please. Does anybody have any thoughts? And I mean, this is going to be just discussion at this point. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about the having the uh, having the four foot sidewalk in addition to the uh, in addition to the trees, the tree boxes, or go 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 towards the direction of the rectangular tree box so that it's not so much in the space? <laughs> what I would say is that it is consistent with the next block. That where, it is consistent? Where there are four foot and the size of the side Okay. Block. So if you're looking for No, that's what I'm looking for. Um, then. Then no. That is keeping it the way it is. I would agree with uh, Yvonne. The, for the area that it's in, it doesn't seem like it's, um, it's not different. It's not like it's uh, tricking down. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe three trees is better than four, depending on where the doors are to the building. Um, so you're not constantly going left, right, left, right, avoiding obstacles. But I think the four foot, as long as it's at minimum uh, four feet, I think that's fine. Okay. So I think that that I think that perhaps we can agree on the three trees as opposed to having the four. 
spaced appropriately to not interfere with doorways that are that are coming in and out. What about um, the vertical element? And the vertical element that we have, are, are we okay with that? That was proposed? Like I'd like it as well. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would request is for the side return panels on the blue colored balconies to match. <laughs> That's fair. Yep. Sure. I'm sorry, side panels to match. Got it. Evening blue, Kevin. <laughs> yes. It, it, it should. Uh, the all, all yeah, I, was, the whole I didn't want to, I didn't want to incur your ire. <laughs> yeah. It would be nice if it's kind of a uniform cladding on the inset of. Right. It's only the only the large balconies have the color, right? The, the well, all of them. All of them. Yeah, I mean, in one of your renderings, it seems that there's just white yeah, so on the small on the. There's like a double size and a half size, right? Uh, to my knowledge, all of them have it. Do you have um, do you have some uh, conditions, uh, Mr. Beekman, that we might want to uh, talk about? Yeah. So notes here. One of the conditions that was testified to tonight was to increase the ground floor window glass area to increase it from what's existing proposed mm -hmm. to 29%. Right, they, they, they did testified that they would do that. Right. Um, with, with translucent glazing. With, uh, right, with, with glazing as well. Mm -hmm. you, you can't see through. Right. 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 Increase. And that would be the same with the garage doors. We had requested that in the past. Agreed. Correct. So that's the same there. Yep. Um, uh, street, we, street, do we want street numbers on the doors of every unit on the street side? Do we? What was that, Daniel? Uh, I, I, I don't know if it was in one of your uh, Street numbers on the door of every unit on the street side are not provided. And I think the plan provides, requires. Requires it? Number. Well, if it requires it, then. I mean, I think this is something that we can certainly agree to. I mean, we'll have the, the retail signage with the name of the retail, and then we can put the address right underneath it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think we see a problem um, I think that we have to include something about the refuse, like we'd spoken about, that the city will take, I mean, uh, that it is private. And if something changes with that, that there's no additional... Uh, any incremental uh, work for the city be beyond what the, what's required? Well, I, I, I think we need to add to that. It shall be compacted. Yes, shall be. It shall be compacted. You're right. Um, and that it will be addressed by a private hauler <coughs> beyond what the city yes. may have to May have provide. to, right. And we'd also spoken that the that about the uh, about the affordable housing that it was one bedroom versus studios, yeah. whatever the ordinance is, the city ordinance that you would comply with whatever that Absolutely, is. Absolutely yes. Okay. Yeah. So it shall be both city ordinance and H U H A C requirements. Yes. Uh, garage doors I have here shall be closed between six p.m. and eight a.m. That was testified to. Um, well, it would be if that's if that's how, when when your retail closes. That's correct. Okay. Right. Yeah. Trash uh, trash hauling shall be from the interior and not from Memorial uh, Drive. That's correct. Okay. Let's testify. Yeah. Correct. Um, Thirty six spaces shall be dedicated solely to residential units. Correct. Uh, that has been revised with the parking count, so it, it would be 32 now, that, and that specifically relates to the mechanical parking spaces. Uh, it provide adequate bike storage. Yes, I think that we've come to that. Yes. Right. And the applicant shall obtain any approvals from the city for any encroachments of the upper floors that extend into the right of way. And obviously, the applicant shall also get whatever approvals that might be required by the uh, Monmouth County Planning Commission. 
Those are the notes that I have. Anybody have anything else that we might have missed? Yeah, one comment I'd like to make concerning the uh, perimeter landscaping in the uh, eastern side along the railroad track and along the uh, uh, southern side there. Uh, as I recall the planting plan, you've got the uh, shrubs and, uh, in a straight line. Is there some way you can break that up? It looks like uh, a fence post with hair on it. Uh, you know, just to, to screen the, uh, the wall and the railroad from the parking lot, it's fine. But kind of maybe stagger the uh, shrubs in such a way so that it's not so linear. Absolutely, um, but, but are we talking about in between uh, uh, our retaining wall or our, our property line wall and the railroad itself? Or are we talking about on the inside of our retaining wall and the parking space? Both. You know, uh, I think I'm not concerned is it looks ugly in both places. And, <laughs> That's, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I understand the, the purpose behind it and I'm all for it, but the, it must be some way we can make it look better. Uh, yeah, yeah it, well, we, we can certainly stagger them, um, and then we can we can change species type. And that, and that, 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 sounds, that sounds good. Yeah. You, just, you just would then want to delegate that to us? We have to I would. With the applicant to that. I would certainly think so. So which trees are these we're talking about? Essentially all the street trees. All the street trees. Okay, yeah, yeah I was actually... <laughs> Brian pointed out that I didn't bring up the, that uh, the street trees, the type, shall right. be coordinated with CCH. But there so are those include, and also this these plantings that... That they, include the other plantings as well. Yes. So all the perimeter trees, effectively street trees and perimeter trees. Uh, and also, um, Doug pointed out that um, with the utility pole, that you'll comply with uh, making an application to move, relocate that utility pole on Memorial Drive, subject to the approval from the utility. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anything else from anyone? If not, uh, can I get a motion to approve this application uh, with the conditions that were just mentioned? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Daniel Sanomio and a second by John Clayton. Mayor John Moore? No. Councilwoman Yvonne Clayton? Yes. James Bonanno? Yes. Jim Henry? Yes, again, I, uh, I, I listened to Werner's comments, and I think they're well taken, but we've come so far with this application already that I think it's, it's too much to ask to change at this point. This is, this is something that should have been done at the uh, uh, initial review. And uh, but Warner's point is well taken, and that I won't vote for it uh, in spite of my misgivings. Thank you, Mr. Henry. And uh, Eric Gallipo has a vote. Yes, and I am thrilled to see an affordable housing development happening here. Um, so it's just we need it so badly. <laughs> Daniel Sanameo? Yes. And finally, Barbara Krizak. Yes. Can I, I'd like to say that <clears throat> this is a very important project because it's a gateway. Yes. And we've waited a very long time to start to developing that area of the city. And so I, I, I thank you for your creativity and for listening to the board and being able to make, be, being flexible. And, but I think that this is just going to be a very, very significant building. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank and you so I much. I appreciate your time and your efforts and your uh, patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Um, can I just have one, one more item before uh, everybody leaves? Not for the applicant, but for uh, the board and the... Uh,
as well as the professionals. I'd just like to uh, mention that Irina, today is her last day as our board secretary. And I'd like to thank her for all of her hard work and dedication that she's given us over this time. We'll miss you. We'll miss you very much. Thank you. Who do I call now? Mayor, I already asked her if she was changing her cell phone and she said no. Who's our new secretary? Yes, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone. Good night.